Let's see. Uh, I see that uh, Robert Thomas has joined us from San Antonio. Welcome, Robert. Yeah, glad howdy. you're here. Hope you can uh, hope you pick up uh, some good stuff. We're glad to have you. Oh, thank you. We've got uh, folks from. Let's see. We're up to right at twenty people right now. So, uh, Brooks, welcome from uh, from Division Five. Glad you're over here. Howdy, everybody. If anybody from Division Five is out there, I appreciate your vote for director. Oh, uh, see, now you can't election. say that stuff. You can't say that. Okay. Especially, especially with the man who's running for president of the NMRA on the call, Brooks. You can't right. do that. All right. Sorry, didn't get the memo for that. Yeah, Gordy, <laughs> I have sufficiently reprimanded him, so it was all. Hey, Gordy. The, there you go. All right. Oh, just like I can't say, just like I can't say that you. We hope that you're going to supposed to be our next president. I can't say that. Right. But you know, I, I, those are the right things, Palmer. Right? Am I doing the right I'm, thing? I'm here? doing it. Now let's let's get on with it. Okay. All right. <laughs> Speaking. All right. I'll of, just mute myself. And, uh, yeah. There you go. Go quiet. go back to mute, Brooks. <laughs> all right. Um, when uh, and, and Gordy, you and Brooks are going to have the opportunity to meet at the 23 convention because Brooks is helping us uh, with all the the AV stuff. He works. Uh, he owns his own AV presentation company that he does major presentations in uh, hotel ballrooms, big, large venues, gymnasiums, stuff like that. And he's uh, he's going to be helping us with all the AV stuff. So that's a that's a good thing. Um Gordy, when do those ballots go out for national elections or international uh, elections? Imminently for the U.S., I believe. Um, Any time between now and the fifteenth is, as far as I understand it. I thought that should've, that's what it was because they the, should have they should have gone out on the sixth. So okay, all right. Well, um, so let me run through a couple of things here. Um, the uh, by the way, Jim Archer, I see that you're on the on the call with us. Thank you, uh, Jim. You'll be happy to know that I did, in fact, have your packet here with your uh, your narrow gauge stuff on it. The reason it didn't trigger with me was because the person that was helping us set up these packets had you in as HO, not HON3. So uh, I'm not naming any names, Mr. Lysing, but I'm just not going to throw you under the bus. I just wanted you to know. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, thanks. <laughs> I, I probably will be moving down there for two or three months, but I, I want to get it in hand before I do move. Yeah. And, and which brings up another idea here. And you'll have to bar pardon me, guys. I'm still uh, <clears throat> dealing with sinus bronchitis issues and stuff like that. So I'll try to, to uh, get through it and I've got throat lozenges here that I'm gonna be taking. taking. So um, let's see, um, the flat car clinic. Um, due to the COVID spike and things like that, we are probably not gonna try to do that until maybe May of this year. Uh, guys, I just don't think it's prudent for us to try to force the issue on something that is a hobby related um, item. We're gonna keep doing these meetings here. We're gonna keep in touch with everybody. Uh, I hope everybody's getting something out of these, these Zoom call meetings, these virtual meetings. Uh, we try to make them as interesting as possible, but right now with things like they are, I just think that it's in our best interest. Um, we've got Dr. Michael Ross over here. Mike, can you weigh in on what you're seeing from the medical community? Well, it's not my area and it's not medical advice. Oh, I get, I get uh, that, but. But, you know, the, the hospitals are between 20 and 30% filled with COVID right now. Okay. So, and, and it's my, my in-laws got it. Um, the right at Christmas time, we still hadn't had Christmas at our house. We still got presents under the tree. And I have vowed that those Christmas decorations will not come down until the family comes in and we have our Christmas celebration, whenever that may be. But uh, anyway, <clears throat> that's uh, that's the way we're handling it. Uh, Speed, welcome from underneath the uh, helix. We're glad you're joining us. So there. Um, the uh, But uh, Jim, we'll get you your packet with all your stuff in it and go from there. Okay. So 
you're in good shape. Uh, I'll figure out some way. If nothing else, I'll bring it to the Plano train show with me. Are you going to be over at the show? Yeah, I'll probably swing by first thing in the morning. Then I've got the club duties from noon to eight in the afternoon. Jim and me are both going to be doing that. So I'll pop by the, the show first thing Saturday morning and try to find you. Okay. Well, I'll be there for Poly Printer. Uh, and we're going to be back in the the area. Um, if you're facing the stage, you'd be on your right. The NMRA booth is uh, is going to be uh, right there in front of the stage, uh, which brings up the next topic on our, our agenda as far as uh, announcements and stuff. <clears throat> um, the Plano train show is a go. Um, Mr. Uh, Lachey, can you give us any updates on that since you're vice president of North Texas Council? Sure, thank you, Mike. Yes, the uh, train show uh, remains on uh, track to uh, open at 10 a.m. next Saturday morning. Uh, for those of us setting up, the um, Spring Creek group will be in doing their normal uh, work on Friday morning at 7. Uh, a couple of things for folks visiting. If you haven't seen the COVID response document, uh, masks covering the nose and mouth will be required for everybody inside the building at all times. Um, we are taking credit cards for the first time. Um, so we'll have two lines uh, at the entry point. The entry point has been changed from years past. Instead of coming in on the east and west side, those will now be exit onlys. And the only entrance into the Plano Event Center will be through the north side center atrium door uh, and we'll have a table on one side set up to take cash, table on the other side to set up to take credit cards. Um, we are abandoning the uh, traditional red uh, steam engine rubber stamp um, and are adapting the uh, Tyvek wristbands uh, to mark people who have paid and, and will be entering. So we have those coming in. Um, Betty Mitchell, is there anything else that I'm not thinking about, oh, one other thing, just be aware uh, if you're coming in on Friday to set up, the Plano Event Center, uh, I learned late yesterday, uh, is being prepped to serve as a vaccine distribution site in Collin County. And as a result, there are six tents being fabricated and installed on the southwest parking lot, which is where we normally park. So just be aware of that. Uh, I have been assured that the vaccine distribution will not take place on Friday and of course on the weekend while we're there at the show. But just watch for those tents and if you see them and want to know what they're all about, uh, it's because uh, the facility is being set up as a distribution site. Betty, is there anything else you can think of that I didn't mention? It's important. Need, uh, we still need volunteers to work the booth, the NMR booth, and the um, booth hours for the membership and the test tracks. Yeah, I saw Saturday and Sundays. Yeah, I just saw a note from Donna and there's some holes in the scheduling uh, for both booth duty as well as show duty. Uh, let's distinguish that. Uh, so if, for those of you who are attending, I would encourage you guys to um, uh, set up um, or get those holes filled. And clinics will be on the stage this year. Um, Entrance, uh, Mike, you may remember from when we toured there back in December, will be on what I'll call stage left entrances. There's a uh, handicapped accessible wrap uh, for those who require that. Um, I'll be bringing one of the LSR projectors mm -hmm. screens. I do have, thanks to speed, a uh, long HDMI cable. So those presenters who wish to use the uh, projector will need an HDMI port on their computer. Um, what else? Any other questions? Let me stop there. The dining area is different this year. The concession stands 
That's people right. Might be aware of it. I'll get you a Eden, second point. Yeah. Eden's going to be outside. It's a one way in, one way out of the concession stands. They're not going to have pizza this year. So yeah. reduce the menu. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we will be setting up uh, tables out on the patio where the um, trackless train sets up to run the kids, uh, which reminds me I need to send somebody a note to make sure that the trackless train guys don't bring those whistles for the kids. <laughs> so no whistles. I hated those things anyway. Uh, no, come on, Mark. And, oh, and, and, and this Where's is where yours? we all thank you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got a good reason to get rid of the whistles. There you go. Can, can we just uh, continue to use this in perpetuity? So every year we go, you know, there's some concern about the flu or whatever. So they. <laughs> yeah, I like that idea. Boy, did you have a question for me? Yeah, I do, Mark. Uh, you were talking about presentation. I'm doing a clinic. Can I not just bring my flash drive and use the laptop that's there? Do I have to bring my whole laptop? Bring your whole laptop. We'll, you know, uh, I've got a projector, HDMI, and there'll be tables there, a, a, a screen up there. And I've even got a real old-fashioned uh, slide projector stand that uh, I'll put the uh, projector on so we can get some elevation to avoid the Keystoning, I think it's called. Um, but yeah, you'll need your uh, laptop. Okay. Uh, Mark, we've got, uh, are you going to need the Division One projector? No, I've got the three LSR projectors uh, that, you know, I've, I got from Speed. Um, and so I will be bringing those and getting you know, that set up. So we're good on projectors. Okay. Um, All right. Uh, Mark, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Who's who's not has a question? It's me. Betty, uh, the ahead. only thing else uh, Mark, was the donuts and coffee is going to be set up at a different area this time. Thank you for mentioning. They need to be aware of that. Yeah. Um, and just so everybody's aware, in in years past, we had a food beverage minimum that we had to pay the Plano Event Center, very much like a hotel venue. And and Mike, you'll you know you'll know what I'm talking about from having yeah. heard the LSR convention in 14 or 15, whenever it was. 16, uh, but that's okay. 15, okay. <laughs> the, um, the Plano Event Center agreed to waive the food beverage minimum for this particular event, but uh, we are going to go ahead and, and purchase coffee and donuts. Um, close to where Poly Printer is going to be set at, there's a hallway that goes to the south side loading dock and just inside that doorway from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. or until they run out on Saturday and Sunday morning, there will be coffee and donuts. Now, it's not going to be self-serve. Uh, those, those food items will be behind a, uh, a screened area and you will be served an individual cup of coffee and <laughs> in a bag. Um, but uh, for those who come early to set up on Saturday or Sunday morning, the uh, council did purchase uh, eight gallons of coffee and eight dozen donuts. When they're gone, they're gone. Um, but just be aware of that. Thank you, Betty. I'm, I'm glad y'all are setting it up right beside my booth. Thanks, Mark. That's, You're welcome. I, I think that's a plus and a minus. It's a good thing for traffic. It's a bad thing because, you know, I'm going to be hitting the donuts. So yep, yep. there you go. All right. Um, anything else as far as the Plano train show is concerned? That's next next Saturday and Sunday. Uh, I think that on our uh, call this morning, we've got uh, several of the clinicians here. I don't see. Um, let's see, Dwayne, you're doing a clinic. Um, let's see, we've got who else is doing clinics, Dwayne. Well, Boyd's doing a clinic, yeah. Joe, you've made their signs. How, how close are you to finishing the signs up? Joe Lysing, there you are. I've got all the, I've got all the information. I just need to uh, print them up and put them on the uh, boards, and I'll get them over to you to take over when you set up for your poly printer. Okay. Um, also, uh, are we going to need Betty. Uh, are you coordinating the booth this year for 
D3? Uh, first thing I've heard about it. No, I, I just add, it's a question. It's not a, oh. a voluntold thing. Uh, it's uh, I, I'm just questioning as to who that should be. Mark, do you know? Is that just a Donna thing? Uh, that, I'm going to plead the fifth on that. Okay. I guess since she's handling all of the, the volunteer assignments, I guess she's doing that as well. Um, the question that I'm going to pose is, uh, are we going to need signage for the, the booth, for the NMRA booth as to the, are we going to be doing the, the little mini clinics and stuff at the booth? So I haven't heard anything about that. So there might be something we need to follow up on. Yeah, I've not seen any email traffic on the, what I'll call a tabletop clinic, Mike. That yeah. doesn't, that doesn't yeah. mean they're not going to happen. But my guess, and this is just my personal opinion, just strictly, you know, I got you, boy. Mark, is that it might be prudent not to do the tabletops this year, just to avoid the crowding around the table uh, and to maintain social distancing. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, I'm with you. You know, even up on the stage, we're going to have those chairs and, and whatnot <coughs> spread out uh, to maintain social distancing. Uh, that's very much on the forefront of the mind of the management at the Plano Event Center. You know, everything they do is designed to maintain the health and, and safety of the citizens of Plano and by extension, anybody who's in that building. Good deal. Boyd, what'd you have? That was the answer that we had reached is no mini clinics at the booth for exactly the reasons that Mark has just articulated. Good deal. I can't say, Good hey, deal. come here, lean, lean in here and let me show you how we do this tree yeah. or this is how you use that pastel in here. So yeah, we're gonna have uh, membership information and the test track. And that's pretty much gonna be it simply because we don't have enough space. Donna's been out there and others. I know she, she and I spoke as recently as last night and uh, just, we don't have be guaranteed enough space. And the last thing we want is for somebody at the center to come up and say, I'm going to have to stop. We're out yeah. of here. Which could happen. So, yeah, no mini clinics this year in the NMRA booth for lack of space. Okay. And for those of you who are not aware, uh, Boyd uh, is running unopposed for the uh, directorship of Division Three. Um, and uh, so he will be taking over for Donna. Uh, and uh, in May, uh, Donna Orr, the current division director in Division Three, is running for LSR president. Uh, and so uh, she's running unopposed. So she will be our new president in the, the LSR, um, and which brings up my next topic is the elections. Um, by the way, uh, welcome Mike Condor from, uh, from Colorado. Hello, Mike. Glad you're joining us. There's several people on the call that you already know. I know you know uh, Dwayne Richardson and, uh, and several other folks there. So we're glad you're here. Um, Jeff Cornelius, welcome to Division One. Glad you, where were you, where were you previously, Jeff? Hit your unmute, hit your space bar. There you okay. go. Okay, I'm unmuted. There you uh, go. Moved to Burleson in about September. Before that, I was in Shreveport in the gotcha. same region. Yep. Different division. Okay. There about five years. And before that, I was in uh, Virginia for around 20 years. Okay. Well, welcome. We're glad you're here. Thank you. Appreciate the welcome. Yep. Bob Mangrum, good to have you join us. I know it's a long trek from where you are, <coughs> but uh, but these virtual meetings sure sure help out. We're glad you're here. Um, election elections. Um, we've got uh, yours truly running unopposed for Division One director, so you guys are stuck with me for another couple of years. Um, I'm I hope to continue to do a good job for you guys and uh, uh, continue to have good meetings. Uh, we have got, thanks to, uh, uh, and if, before I move on from the elections, be sure and vote guys, 
however you want to vote, just vote. Uh, and I think that there's only one national election that's contested. And Gordy, you want to talk about that for a second? Not, not really. But there, there are other, there are other. Um, there well, are. Mute um, <laughs> yourself, and I'll move on. Okay. No, no, no. There's not just <laughs> one. Um, there are, <laughs> there are, there are a lot of changes on the national board. There are quite a few positions up. The, um, I'm not sure um, any other director roles affect uh, the LSR region, but the. The, no, I think the North America at large is one of them that would be on your ballots. Um, obviously, president, vice president is unopposed. Um, it's uh, Rick Rick Coble, the current secretary, um, which means we'll have a have a new secretary appointed in July. And uh, obviously, there's the president, uh, which is uh, myself and and uh, Bob Amsler, current general counsel, on the ballot. Palmer, you need to throw your name in the hat for that secretary's job. You don't have enough you're doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> but then but then there's also uh, i know it doesn't affect you guys directly but obviously all board members do affect you the eastern director position is up and the pacific director as well so there'll be some significant changes there on the board uh, okay. in july at national level but just keep it's more important Go ahead, Jeff. i see you're unmuted locally. i know you're waiting to say something jump in there buddy <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I have to go back and review to see if there's an Article 25 in the um, National uh, Convention, because if, if there is, I would never make it. Okay, all right. <laughs> this is the, the 20, 25th Amendment to the Executive Handbook. That's it, that's <laughs> it. Yeah. Says, that, says that when voluntold, you can't say no. That's what it says <laughs> now. <laughs> oh, that's great. Okay, um, Gordy, one more thing, since you're our our international uh, yes, director currently, are they going to be holding a, a special election for any of the spots that are going to be vacated? Secretary, um, international so secretary, board of director, that kind of secretary, stuff. Secretary, yeah, okay. So um, without, without getting too into the uh, um, constitutional uh specialties of the NMRA the secretary is actually an appointed position by the incoming administration so okay. the president will make a recommendation and that would have to be uh, passed by two-thirds majority of the board of directors um there is uh, an assistant secretary so it's more likely we would bump the assistant secretary up and uh, and seek a new assistant secretary to learn the ropes because there's quite a lot of uh, good complicated good politics there for them to get into and um, the executive handbook is uh, something that you could use uh, like an old phone book. So uh, there's lots of things for them to learn. Uh, yes, if there, um, if I um, am elected, it would leave a vacancy on the board. Um, it would depend on the recommendation of the National Nominating Committee and um, myself <laughs> okay. if I was the president. Well, we know um, I'm out. <laughs> Well, ultimately, it's up to the president to to appoint someone for 12 months or to put it out to uh, a vote. Um, so there would potentially be an open directive slot on the national board that would need to be filled for at least tw the remaining 12 months of that term if I was elected. Gotcha. And, uh, of course, it's at large worldwide director. Well, everyone seems to have coined the fact that it's the very large at large worldwide director. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what's going on there, but... <laughs> That's, hey, good. That's, That's where good. we are. <laughs> uh, the large director at large. I got it. That's good. That's good. Okay. Uh, was there, Gordy, help me out one more thing here. And yep. are we having a dues increase again? Did the board vote for that? Not yet. Not yet. But it's on the um, agenda. I thought the January 1st one already took effect. That was last, that was the Jews of, that's already been. Yes. Yeah, so that was already been notified. In addition to what's already, so yes. In addition to what's already been notified, there hasn't been an increase in Jews. But of course, last J July was notified of Jews increase in line with inflation as usual. But um, no, it's under, no, it's under discussion. Got it. Yeah. Um, and uh, if anyone's interested, I've been working with a British region and I reduced their dues by 10%. They invited me to sit on their board for a couple of meetings and I persuaded them to reduce the dues by 10%. So you know which way I feel about where dues increases should go. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because 85 bucks a year is getting to be a bit steep. 
it's an absolute disgrace, but I can't really comment on it. <laughs> you just did. So there we have it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, convention update. Mark Lachey, uh, regional convention. The uh, Hang on just a minute. I've got this queued up just for you, Mark. Uh, here we go. The Tulsa Union Convention, June 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th, a collaboration between the Lone Star Region, the Mid-Continent Region, and the Indian Nations Division of the National Model Railroad Association. Mark, take it away. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, our convention uh, remains on track. Uh, I would encourage people that uh, if they're serious about attending, take advantage of the early bird registration between now and March 1st. Um, we will be taking a look at our registration numbers uh, after March 1st uh, as our first cancellation date with the hotel venue is 90 days out, which makes that March 15th. So I've got a week or so that uh, the leadership in the two regions and Ken Erler is my counterpart in Tulsa and I will talk about where we're at financially. I have been encouraged by the number of registrations that I've seen come in just in the last few days since our last little MailChimp uh, advertising piece went out. Um, I'd like to see at least 50 people signed up by the 1st of March. Uh, when we were planning this, I was very conservative in our budgeting and, and established a budget based on 100 regular attendees. And if we can get halfway there by March 1st, we'll be in good shape. I also think that uh, hopefully by uh, the 1st of June that a, a good number of us will have been able to receive our phase 1B vaccines or whatever they call them in your individual states. Uh, I learned from Kim this week that the terminology for who's eligible varies a little bit by state. What we call it here in Texas is not the same terminology in Oklahoma, but I digress. Um, we've got 20 good clinics lined up. We've got layouts lined up. Um, in terms of the dates, just be aware that uh, I think it's actually our operating sessions will run from Wednesday the 16th of that evening uh, through Sunday morning the 20th. Um, so if you're planning on coming up to operate, just be aware that we will do operating sessions, or at least that's a plan for Wednesday, and I believe that date's June 16th. Any questions? None. Well, very good, Mark. You did a good Thanks, job. Mike. All right. Um, we're still looking for volunteer help for the uh, the 2023 National Convention. So uh, if you're interested in helping out on that and getting some volunteer points uh, and getting that volunteer certificate out of the way, um, we can do that. Dwayne will let you talk about the AP program in just a few minutes, but that's, uh, that's something to do there. I got an email yesterday from um, Tim Blackwell uh, of Cowcatcher Magazine, and Tim was giving me some, uh, some a lead here, and it's actually, if I can get it right here, brought up. Uh, Hobbytown USA, get back over where I was. Hobbytown USA uh, owner, if I can get my, there it comes. All right, here we go. The, the owner of Hobbytown USA in uh, Dallas, a guy by the name of uh, Ted uh, Sparrow. Uh, is looking for somebody to be a repairman and work in their uh, East Mockingbird, Mockingbird store in Dallas. He's trying to make this a go-to place for model trains, and he's converting the upstairs of his store into a train mecca, quote unquote. He's got five locations in DFW, and he's recently bought out Wild Bills over in Irving, and he's moving uh, all but some basic model railroad supplies and mostly sets to the Dallas store. So he's looking for somebody to be um, a repair person. 
uh, and do all sizes, all scales, uh, all types of repairs. Plus they do, they handle uh, second hand stuff and they need somebody to be able to clean up those, uh, those <coughs> uh, inbound pre-owned products so that they can go on the shelves and be, uh, be sold in the store. So if you're interested, um, contact me and I'll give you the rest of the lead information uh, as far as who to contact and how to do that. Uh, you can reach me at director at calcatcherdivision.org. That's a good way to do that. Um, we are looking for help on the Division One website uh, is to help and work with Mr. Corley. Uh, that is, Mr. Corley has been, Mike Corley has been absolutely the yeoman on this. He has been the, um, the sole webmaster since we started this trek and uh, about, uh, what is it, five years ago, four or five years ago now. And he has handled everything 100% by himself. If you have skills that would be applicable to be helping on the website, um, we would like to, uh, to get that volunteer uh, help on that and let uh, Mr. Corley mentor you and then step into the background and let you be the lead after a training period and uh, let him be your backup. So uh, that is the only position in our leadership team that we don't have a backup for. Every single other position in our division uh, is a, uh, has a backup. So that said, uh, I think I, I know of no other division and Gordy, you can, you can weigh in on this. I don't know of another division anywhere in, I don't know of another division anywhere in the uh, organization and that will. And there's this, it's just a battle. Well, that's, that's pretty nice. It's got a little talk. I'm going to mute everybody here for just a minute. Well, I'm going to. This one's the cheapest one. There we go. All right. So um, the uh, uh, I know of no other division anywhere in the organization that has a leadership team of 16 to 18 that all that there's a backup for every single position in the leadership team. Gordy, are you aware of anybody else in the organization that has that? Um, nope. I see not, you're not, not, not 16. I mean, it, here in Scotland, we, we go for the North Korea approach. Either no one wants to volunteer or I just do everything. So it, yeah, yeah, you're doing pretty well. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased with what we've got, and, uh, and I want to thank everyone uh, that's a member of our leadership team, and I want to thank everybody uh, in the division for, for uh, supporting the division the way you do. Um, that is uh, well, one way to get volunteer points, uh, both for the division and the convention, which leads me to Mr. Richardson. Uh, take it away on a little bit of talk about the AP program, if you would. <clears throat> well, about the only new news uh, that's fit to print is uh, our, uh, our don't know what, how to actually refer to uh, Ezekiel. Uh, we have a member down north of Mexico City who has oh. uh, gone through some virtual uh, judging. Well, we finally got the rest of his paperwork in. We'll be submitting his scenery and his electrical. Um, we have a kind of a plan in place with him to continue working to, uh, towards his MMR. Uh, also uh, want to announce the LSR has a new master model railroader, uh, division threes, Larry Swagger became model railroader six, six, six last month. So just to let everybody know, uh, pass along your congrats to Larry and please take some of this COVID time and put pen to paper. I know several of y'all that are sitting on certificates you've earned and you just <laughs> haven't done the paperwork. If you've got any questions, please reach out. Let me know. Be happy to help. I'll answer any questions you've got. 
All my contact info is on the website. Please feel free to reach out. Okay, Mr. Petrarca, I think you've got your hand raised. <coughs> that is that is correct. I don't know if I have to put it down on this thing or not, or if it goes down or whatever, but uh, okay, I'll lower it. There we go. Uh, I just want to say one, uh, I'm wearing this t-shirt yeah, today. Don't, don't suck up, Petrarca. Uh, That's just ridiculous. No, no, no. <laughs> there, there, there's a definite reason for it. Oh, okay. Uh, All right. Okay. Uh, the, uh, in that, this is Dwayne's dad's railroad, whom I met a long time before I met Dwayne. And uh, Paul was, was very um, <clears throat> pivotal in, in my path to my, uh, MMR. Uh, in, and my viewpoint about the whole program since then. And uh, some of you know, but I'm the, the AP manager for the Arizona division. And I just wanted to, to, to jump in here and say, uh, along, just along the lines that, that Dwayne was talking about in terms of, you know, get it done. Um, since August, we have two members of the Arizona division that have each earned four or five of the seven certificates and are well on the way to uh, the last two. And uh, the, the issue right now is both of them need cars, which requires uh, an in-person visit. But uh, this has been done in in the whole face of, of the, the current or the 2020 situation. I'm not going to call it the current situation. I'm going to call it the 2020 situation. And um, uh, so, so it's, it's possible to move along and get this stuff done. Uh, if you just think about it and, and set it and make it a priority. And that's really what I had. Cool. Yeah. And one thing I want to add to that. <clears throat> A lot, I've heard this from a lot of people, and it is a misconception that once you decide you want to start working on the AP, all of the work that you apply toward it can only be judged for the work you start from there going forward. And this is not the case. It, it, is, it is applicable to everything you built from the time you were born to what you've got now. I mean, the, the, one of the common things I've gotten pitched back to me is, well, my layout's already complete. I don't need to do any more scenery. Well, your scenery is already done. Let's get it judged. So um, take a look at what you guys have got at home on your home layouts. Give it some consideration. Again, if you've got any questions, please feel free to reach out. Greg and, McComas, and I'm calling you out in front of everybody right now. All right. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I am not opposed to throwing somebody under the bus in front of everybody else on this kind of stuff. So just letting you know. All right. Welcome, by the way, welcome to our meetings. <laughs> Thank you. I, I was going to actually call myself out because okay, you are right. You are right. Uh, and Dwayne is right as well. Um, I think a lot of misconceptions are, are out there and uh, having a chance, you know, Bruce and you came by and talked about it. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's a, it's a whole lot of stuff we're going to see today um, that's, that's done and there that all co goes toward that those certificates. I mean, gold, gold spike as well. Gold so spike. I just get dude. my butt off, you know, get my butt to print some paperwork out. That's it. That's really what it was. No, to. absolutely. Yep. No, I, I'm okay with that. You're I'm good. I'm good with that. And, and, you know, Corley's in the same boat as you are and, and Mr. Corley. Uh, <clears throat> so there you have it. Uh, Lysing, you're not far away. Um, as soon as you can get some scenery down on your layout, you're going to be able to get that golden spike as well. So, by the way, I did forget to mention Mr. Lysen got his volunteer. Yay. Good job. Good job. Hey, Dwayne, if you would, I need you to uh, send me photographs via email of the uh, Leo Paletti Award, if you would. Lori ask, uh, ask if she can get a, a copy of that. Oh, you bet. Award. I'll make that happen. If you don't mind, that'd be great. Um, all right, uh, let's see here. Um, we've got Mr. Petrarca over here that just took a bite of something. Uh, sorry to, to, yeah. to jump well, on you right there, Bruce, but um, for, for just a moment here, DCC Corner, does anybody have any questions uh, about DCC stuff, um, installs, 
questions, this, that, and the other. I did find, I'm going to, I'm going to throw a tip and trick for DCC in there for you, Bruce, if you don't mind, uh, to, to lead in. Uh, I was having some problems with a, a TCS Wow Sound uh, decoder the other day. And one of the things that I always had a complaint about with, with those control of uh, those, um, those decoders, when you're using the voice assist, I always had a problem. If you choose a particular bell or a whistle or whatever, and they've got so many of them on their decoder that if I choose whistle number four and there's 30 of them, by the time I circle back around to whistle number four, I never could figure out which one it was again and that I like so much. <clears throat> and my complaint was that you could never remember which one it was and you by the time you circle back around it was it was lost again and i mentioned that to the guy at tech support that it would be nice if you could go back and forth he goes you can and i said really he goes yep you sure can all you've got to do is reverse the direction on the locomotive and it will go backwards so that if you're if you're you like bell number four and you've got that one and you go three forward and you like another one, then you can go three backwards and listen to the, the one that you originally had. So you can go forward and back. And, and I don't know of anywhere that that's published out there. So one of those little things there. Uh, also, I will tell you that CV eight equals eight is not the, the factory reset on all decoder types. Ask me how I know this. So there you have it. Um, yeah, I know. And, and and boy, I wish that were the case. Yeah, yeah. You know, it would be so much easier. Uh, CV eight equals eight. CV eight equals two. CV thirty equals two. Um, there's a whole bunch of different ones, and you have to know which decoder you've got to know which you know, which one's going to work for you. Mark Lachey, question. Yeah, Bruce, I could probably research this, but since I've got you here, uh, I'm assuming you're familiar with the NCE products. I've been a long time CVP or easy DCC user, but I'm looking for a, a C system that will support all 28 functions of the new Soundtracks decoders. Mm -hmm. Does NCE have a product which will support on uh, any oh. any current any current NCE product will support all twenty eight functions. All twenty eight without having to remap or any of that kind no, of. No, no, no. Uh, on the, on their, um, well, no, not the 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 what they call the hammerhead, the power cab mm -hmm. or pro cab will very easily. There's a there's a button that you push and it takes it from zero through twelve to doing. 20 through 20 or, or you know t the teens and then the 20s um as you push this button so if you got something on 28 you push the button twice and then push eight so it's two eight um the the, the small intermediate cabs don't have that capability um you can map the option button to one of those functions but you don't have the whole range available so, but the power cab and the pro cab, which is their, their top of the line system uh, is the pro cab. Um, but any of those that have that hammerhead shape to them, uh, yeah, they're, they work just fine. Thank you. And Mark, uh, I'm in the same boat you are as far as uh, Easy DCC and CVP products. And if you're looking to change to a different command station uh, rather than the CVP command station. Mr. Petrarca has been doing some research on my behalf and there are several things. I don't know if you've got the uh, zone chair or the zone, whatever the other zone master, zone master and the zone shares. Um, those are compatible with NCE products. Well, it's interesting you bring that up my system so old, I've still got the big box five amp uh, power stations, uh, whatever we call them, uh, from CVP that are probably close to 20 years old. Mine, mine too, yeah. 
And so I don't have any of the zone share, zone master kind of stuff. You know, I'm not that current in that technology. Um, I've been told that I can continue to use those power supplies. Uh, is that true, Bruce? Uh, I don't know about, about well, the, the, um, the box itself, I don't know, and I can, I can probably find out. The, the issue is that um, CBP never set up to sell through dealers, and so they're really tight-fisted about uh, information about their system, and uh, so, and that's why when I had Litchfield Station, I, I you know, I didn't didn't share it, sell it because I, I they wouldn't even give me a discount on it. You know, they sell it to me for the same price they'd sell it to to uh, to you. So why would I uh, <laughs> why would I carry the product? Um, and they couldn't understand why it was that I didn't support you know didn't uh, support them. And I'm going well. You know, I can't make any money on the deal. Why, I, why would I do it? Um, but as far as your situation goes, uh, I think that uh, the, um, and actually I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna put a plug in right here. Um, I'm on the schedule for the, fe for the February division meeting to do a clinic about DCC. And my plan is to talk about boosters and uh, all of that as part of that meeting. And, uh, you know, knowing, knowing that the audience is in the back, the back door of CVP, um, I need to, I need to know what of their products, uh, can work with, with other work and play well with other people. And quite honestly, that's, that's very difficult, uh, because it becomes obvious when you do that, that you're taking a customer away from, from them and they get really, Keith gets really quiet, shall we say. And so, uh, uh, but, the, but the, in your case, you might be able to use the five amp booster that you have. Mm -hmm. If not, I have about $150 solution to that situation. Uh, and literally you could start with a, with a power cab, which has a two amp system built into it. And, um, expanded out for about another $150 to um, fill in uh, what, you, what you have in the way of, of power on the track uh, using a, a product from Tam Valley Depot that's a rated as a five amp booster. Uh, it's, a little, it's a little board about this big. Uh, and it's, it's really, it's, it's five amps maximum about three, three and a half amps continuously. So a couple of them will, would replace the, the CVP box that you've got. And, uh, so, and uh, they work very well. So, um, you know, I think that answers your question. Yes, thank you. All right, anybody else have any other questions uh, on the DCC side, decoder installation, anything technical issue? Reggie, what you got? Well, let's see. Sorry I'm late, everybody. It's been one of those days. Um, uh, so I've been working on a um, decoder buddy install uh, with an ESU Loke Sound. Now, I don't have an ESU Loke Sound um, programmer, but what I did was I used JMRI. And what I found was if you take the Loke Sound software and you export it as a TXT file, import that into JMRI, you can program it. But then even with ESU, you still have some little issues here and there. So what I found, I was having some problems like with this, I'm doing this SD60 Mac, like I've been working on this forever. Sorry for those, it says BNSF. But anyway, there is a little um, decoder buddy, what's called a decoder buddy light tester. It's a little chip, you put it on there. And before you do all your wiring, it came, it, uh, I was on a forum and Nick, Nick, uh, train, uh, Nick Santo sent me, sent this to me. So what you do is you can program all of your settings and see the lights light up on the board correctly. And that way, you know, that if you screw up your wiring, it's your wiring and, and not your, not your chip. But that's what I've done for, for me. This is my, actually, I've like my third DCC upgrade, but my first low sound. Loke sound is a little particular. 
Yeah, they are. You're, you're, you're absolutely correct. But uh, good, good, uh, good stuff there, uh, Reggie. Anything else? No, other than I would like a look, uh, look sound uh, program. I just, if that's just a workaround I have, I use, um, like I said, I export it from the local sound software as a TXT file and import it into JMRI, but you still oh, have and, some and, battles <laughs> with, yeah, well, you, you will. The other, the other option is to, um, uh, with JMRI read the decoder and then, and then go ahead and set it up the way you want it. Um, through JMRI, the the only thing that you absolutely have to have the the looks on programmer for is uh, the uh, to to load sound files into the into the looks on decoder. Correct. Yeah, yeah. That that's the only thing. But other than that, we're good. It's uh, one thing I do notice about the if you do the I. So what I had to do was uh, DCC guy replied to me on that on that read all. Don't read all. Just read the sheet because if you read yes. all, you'll be there baking cookies <laughs> well the other the other issue is and i think this this occurs with the low sound product um that some of the some of the jmri files will go out and try and read a cv that might not be supported in the particular decoder that you have and then it'll just hang on that cv so um it's another good reason to only do it sheet by sheet but the other you know if you know that you've got one you know, you've been working with it and you know that it'll, it'll, it will go through all by itself. Um, I've been known to just say, okay, read all and, and, you know, go off and have lunch or something <laughs> and come back and it's, it may be done. <laughs> yeah. 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 Cool. Thanks. Uh, anybody else have anything on DCC stuff? All right. Uh, tips so we'll and tricks. Next month. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Bruce. We appreciate it. Hey, I have a quick one. Okay. What, uh, I have like uh, some decoders and some old engines and I'm trying to redo some stuff. Um, but what, it, uh, the decoder I have is just a regular solid decoder or whatever, but uh, I'm hooking it up from the cab of a steam engine. And I was wondering what the minimum, uh, gauge of wire I should use to hook it up or whatever to the decoder. I mean, you know, like, uh, is 24 gauge good and good on that or, or should I use 30 or what? Well, uh, uh, anything larger than, than 30 or 32 is the normal installation, usually 30, um, because it's flexible enough to get around where you need it to go and um for in 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 ho or or um, you know any of the 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 typically the one one amp style decoders um 30 30 gauge is, is fine for those um the uh where you get into the the stronger or the the larger gauges of wire uh is mostly or well where I when I'm doing installation, I use um, I'll use like uh, even up to eighteen in uh, garden locomotives and things like that on the track and motor leads because that's the only place that they'll draw up in the the four amp range on some of them um, up as high as as uh, there's some you know, USA locomotives that draw as much as 30 amps on start and uh, as much as eight amps continuously. And they have a special NCE decoder for that. Uh, so there, you know, you really get into some robust wiring, but in the, you know, from, from O scale on down, oh, and O scale, I'll use like maybe 24, something like that for the motor in the, in the track, uh, particularly the track because they're frequently have large uh, boosters there so that if there's a short, internal to the locomotive uh, and you have smaller wire, you can actually melt the wire. Uh, so uh, that's why I go the stronger, stronger um, wire on the, uh, on the track side for in O scale. And typically that's not something that you're, you're caring that much about um, the flexibility other than you know, down to the trucks themselves. So 
you know, that's, that's kind of, kind of my, um, my guide, if you will, that makes sense. Yeah, this is HO. Yeah. So 30 gauge is fine. Um, in fact, uh, Digitrax makes a, uh, decoder wire kit that's about $10 and you get, um, you know, like five or six feet of every color, uh, all the, all of the nine standard colors uh, Who was in there. Bruce? That's Digitrax. Digitrax. Uh, and then, and TCS sells, um, uh, wire in both 30 and I believe 32 gauge on a per color basis. So it's like 10 feet of black or 10 feet of red or whatever else. And um, so, you know, I usually recommend the, the Digitrax kit for people that are just getting, just getting started. Cause you know, it's, 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 it's the, it's the assortment and you can uh, do whatever you want to with it. Uh, and then with the, um, uh, and then I just, I just buy the TCS stuff uh, as I need it. Okay. I need some more purple or I need some more green or whatever. And they, and TCS also offers the esoteric colors like, black with a green stripe and, and black with a white stripe and those sorts of things. So um, that that's the place to go there. Good deal. Thank you, Bruce. Anybody Thanks. else? Melvin? Okay, good deal. Good deal. All right. Um, <clears throat> tips and tricks. Uh, I know Dwayne normally has tips and tricks for us. I'm going to lead off with one that uh, is uh, I've been doing some decaling uh, on some locomotives here recently uh, on some steam locomotives uh, and the decal paper and the decals were very um, the, the writing on there. It was cab details to go on the side of a steam engine. And on my railroad, the Texas and St. Louis, which was the precursor to the St. Louis Southwestern or the Cotton Belt, um, that at one point they named their locomotives after individuals in addition to having a number. And the cab details on a C-19 narrow gauge locomotive are very, very small. It was very difficult to read the decal somebody else pointed this tip out, but I'm going to echo it here. If you will take a regular black Sharpie, just like this, and on the back, make sure it's on the back of the decal paper. If you take your black Sharpie and color behind the decal, then whenever you get ready to, to soak it in your solution and loosen the decal up, you can see the white decal a whole lot better against the black background and it works flawlessly make sure you do it on the back because if you don't you're going to mess up your decal but <coughs> if you do that <coughs> excuse me if you do that it makes the ability to see what you're using in the decal a whole lot easier uh Dwayne, you got something else for us yeah. Uh, by the way, you're welcome for that tip. Uh, you. you do have to you do have to color it a lot because the idea is you're wanting that ink to soak through the back side of the paper. Uh, so it does take a, a fairly new Sharpie and it needs to have, you know, you may have to put a couple of passes on it to get it there. Um, I'm going to be actually covering some of that next Saturday in uh, in my clinic. We're doing a, a decaling clinic there at the train at the train show. But uh, um the only other thing I might toss in as far as decaling goes, um, if you've got some older decals or some really, really thick <laughs> decal film, uh, if you look at the side of the car or whatever you're putting the decal on, you will sometimes run across a scenario where the paint job runs across, it goes up, it goes across the decal, comes back down and goes on. Um, I've, I've got some old decals where it's really, really noticeable. Um, I'll go and take a, a really fine, uh, emery board fingernail file kind of deal. I go over to Sally beauty supply and I buy them by the grit instead of going to Walmart and buying the, whatever you get in the box kind of thing. Uh, they have them in everything from 60 grit course all the way up to three and 4,000, which you, once you get up above that high, you're down to kind of polishing. So I'll take that decal after I get it cut out. 
I'll go through with a really fine emery board and hold it at a, you know, roughly a 45. You don't have to put it, you know, it doesn't have to be a perfect angle, but just kind of take it and <clears throat> make a pass or two around the edge of that decal film and it will bevel the edges on it a little bit and it will help hide that look. It won't be so stark as to go up, 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 up you know, it'll just kind of, your eye will kind of pass over the top of it a little easier that way. Uh, most of the newer films are thin enough where that's not a problem, but if you've got some of the older kits and especially if it's something that's old enough that you're, you really want to use the artwork, <clears throat> but you're worrying about the decal shattering because of its age, and you've gone in and put that uh, microfilm across the top of it, uh, it will get really, really thick. So that's something you might want to consider doing. I'll add something onto that one, uh, Dwayne. When you're talking, looking at your decals, uh, a lot of the old decal sheets are fairly old and uh, for lack of better terms, will crack easily, yep. break, whatever. Um, there's a tendency to get the decal paper a little bit wet and then pull it out and set it on the side. Rather than do that, if you'll just turn it upside down and put, leave it and put it in the water, you won't lose the glue on the back of it, the adhesive, but it also won't float off. And then when you're ready to use it, pull it off. Because I know that um, for some of the old de older decals, like I was dealing with on a couple of things with Mike on uh, some of his uh, containers, you pull on it just even slightly, <coughs> it would break. And, and yeah, I'm sorry for that, but those are brand new decals straight up from the store. Okay. I'm, I was, not, it was, it was not picking on you specifically. No, no, no. I just, just old didn't decals. Think there was a problem. A lot, a lot of us have old, you know, you like to buy a champ decal. I can promise you they're no less than 10 years old. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I don't care if you bought it yesterday. Well, and, and, to, and to Jeff's point, I mean, some of the new decal films are so thin that even brand new ones are very prone to that. I mean, you've got to really make sure that that glue's loosened up and you can maneuver that whole decal around on the sheet before you try applying it because you will pull them apart. <clears throat> uh, the other thing I, when in working with some containers that uh, Mike printed off for me, uh, Excuse me. prime them. You know, there's there's an issue with the ribbing if on a uh, 3D printer that a lot of people don't like, including myself. Uh, but don't pr prime with just any ordinary primer. Go to your um, local automotive store. They have Duplicolor puts out a gray primer or a red primer, either one, that has what they call filler in it. If you'll use that, the ribbing will disappear. So just an FYI, that's an easy way. Then you cover, you know, put it back on. Uh, any color that you put on there will be as slick as it was as if you had someone uh, buy casting. So those are a couple of things that uh, I worked on the last couple of weeks that I thought might be worth sharing. And shameless plug, if you'd like to see what those containers look like after they've been printed, painted, and decaled using the Palmer technique, Stop by the poly printer booth next week at the uh, at the Plano train show and you'll be able to see those live and in person. So uh, any other tips and tricks? I've got one. Go ahead. So I've been working on rocks, uh, doing texture molds and everything. This is a, a mold I made years ago, but it's with a product called Seal Putty. And it uh, is basically an epoxy putty that you can mix up. We use it in, I'm a taxidermist, and we use it in work to make tine repairs and everything on deer. But it works great for doing rocks. You can go out, find a rock, in 15 minutes, you can have a mold. <coughs> where, do you get, where do you get that product? Uh, I'll share a link in the chat. Um, it's like $40 for a two-part deal. So it, it's a little pricey, but when you think of, I've had this mold for several years, probably six or seven years. So uh, they last a while. They're still very flexible and you can make a mold of anything you want. I mean, anything you get, I've made molds for tool handles, handles on tools, just one breaks, I can put another one on with some Bondo. So it's, uh, there's no need for mold release or anything. You, you don't need to really prep your surface. You can just mix this up, 
spread it on 15 minutes. It'll cure and you can peel it off. Cool. That's great. Yeah. Put that in the chat. If you don't mind, that'd be great. If you mm -hmm. Source location on there. Thanks. Yeah. Paul. Yes, sir. Hey, Cole, a uh, quick question for you. I know with latex molds and uh, RTV molds, it's really important to keep them out of UV. Uh, I've had some molds go brittle and go bad on me doing that. Uh, but if you keep them in the dark and everything, they'll last for decades. I've got a couple of rock molds I did that are probably 25 or 30 years old now. Uh, mm -hmm. Does this stuff kind of need to be stored similarly? Um, it, I mean, it's probably best to, honestly. Mm -hmm. I've just kept mine in a drawer. So... Um, I've never had a problem. I've never crossed a, a, a problem with any of the other molds that I have. Um, typically they're in the, my workroom at the shop. So, um, they don't ever see sunlight anyways. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So, um, honestly, I, I don't know on that one. Any other tips and tricks that anybody's got that they want to share with the group real quick? Mike? Yes. Yeah, I liked your idea with the Sharpie, but I think the key word is Sharpie. Uh, I would be careful about using a water-soluble black uh, marker because that might come off in the, in the drink. <laughs> yep. Yep, that's not a, not, a bad, not a bad point to make right there as well. Yeah, I've used Sharpie and I've used Marks a lot both and they both work well. Yeah. Uh, everybody, Cole has put his, uh, his source link there in the chat for picking up that material to do the, the uh, rock molds with, or molds of any kind for that matter. So, yeah. All right. <clears throat> Let's see here. Uh, yes, David, you got something? Cranda? Um, I thought, also thought, in addition to the auto primer, there's um, Tamiya uh, surface primers have kind of that feature, too, that they can do some filling. And, it, and it's, I think it depends on which one you get, because I think they do make it like kind of different grades, almost like uh, uh, fineness to coarseness that, you know. The, yes, they do. Yeah. So that also could be a alternative for uh, the auto auto body primer. Good, Crand. I see you and yeah. and Lachey are working in the competition to have your COVID beard. I'm impressed with you guys. So, uh, uh, Mike, I have something to add to the primer part. Sure, uh, bro. I was I've, yeah. I've been painting a little locomotive, and uh, I've got the uh, I can grab it here, Mister Hobby. Uh, it's uh, Mr. Serpitzer, and they have different uh, grits of it, of like 500, 1,000, 1,200, 1,500. And uh, I find this stuff goes down really smooth. And, of course, the, uh, the lower grit, like 500, would fill uh, cracks and stuff. Um, but a lot of uh, modeler, arm, armor modeler guys use this, and uh, I find it goes down really smooth. So that's another product to look at. And they have a different get, colors are you also. Just getting that, where are you getting that, Brooks? Just uh, at the hobby store. I, I'm sure they have it at Hobby Town. I I bought these online. Okay. Uh, but um, and uh, if you use uh, I have the the I use this with the Mister Color uh, leveling thinner, and so it does some leveling properties to it, makes it go down smoother as well. So okay. Um, Guys, the, the, one. Thinner, the thinner comment was, I mean, the uh, primer comment was only for a specific use. It was for 3D print, where you have the grain of each of the layers, and you want to do away with it. You can either file it, sand it, or in my case, I primed it. You use a, a heavy primer. If you're going to do an engine, you're going to do figures, you're going to prime something else, you don't want to use it because it'll cover up detail exactly yeah uh you go you go with the thinner primers you go with the normal standard primers in this case it was for the containers of a 3d printer and you didn't want to see the lines associated with each of the layers 
you right. um, with yeah. a thicker with a uh, thicker primer, and the primer was a filler primer. And like I said, and I can buy a whole bottle of Duplicolor to last me for the next two or three years. Whereas for this, for more than what I paid for that, you can get a small bottle of primer from Tamiya. But the Tamiya primer is great, especially on the thin stuff for figures uh, and doing. I will also tell you that if you're going to paint, paint a locomotive, you're not going to paint it with an acrylic color. So make sure you get a primer that's associated with uh, the enamel or the lacquer that you're going to use. Yes, on that 3D print, is that a is that a FDM or a, a resin? Uh, it's it's five. It's the um, um, well, I mean, it's my filament. Experience. It's FDM. It's, it's, it's ABS. It's FDM. Okay, that's that's good. That's good to know. I was looking for better technologies for uh, we. I, I got that uh, that smooth it goo as well for FDM. It works okay. So it's good to know about the duplicolor. And and guys, Jeff helps me in the booth at Poly Printer. Uh, I will tell you right now, and this is one of the things I talk about, and I'm not trying to get sidetracked here. And Mike, I'm going to pick up. I saw you raise your hand, uh, Condor. I'll get you in just a second. That's okay. Um, the uh, On the 3D printing that we do for this printer, um, understand that, and, and this is an analogy I use whenever I'm talking to potential buyers, you can build a house. But if you build a house, you can use several different types of hammers. You can use a ball peen hammer. You can use a sledge hammer. You can use a framing hammer, et cetera. All right. You can use a tack hammer. Um, all those different hammers have a specific use and, and application. Make sure you use the right tool for the job. Okay. You don't want to use a sledge hammer when you're putting up your cabinets, all right? Same thing with a, a 3D printer. So with your 3D printer, uh, if you're trying to get really, really fine detail with rivets, with NBWs or whatever, you wanna make sure that you're using a resin printer because they're gonna give you the best results. Now, as speed, how many printers do you have right now? Four, three, okay, I missed it one, okay. <clears throat> there are pluses and minuses <clears throat> to all those different printers that Speed's got. That's the reason he's got three of them, right, Speed? It depends on what you're doing to, to use which printer. Liquid resin printers, the resin that you use to print with has a very finite shelf life. A filament printer, if I started a roll of filament for my 3D printer, tomorrow and printed two things with that roll and then just sealed it up, put it in a baggie and, and with a silicone bag, a, a packet to keep the moisture out of it, I can open that back up three years from now and it'd be fine. Speed with a, with a, using one of his resin printers, once you open that bag of resin, you got to use it up. So uh, the, there's pluses and minuses to, to all circumstances. And Jeff is using, is helping me in the booth showing what the potential with the right modeling techniques could be using a filament printer, which is a lot less expensive than a resin printer and gives you some other benefits. That's the reason we show that. So <clears throat> that's it. Uh, Mike, what do you got? I just was going to ask Brooks what grit he uses on them, Mr. Surfacer. Uh, well, the uh, the 500 I've heard builds cracks and you can brush it so you can do some texturing with it. Um, I've I've used the 1200 and the 1500. Uh, if you want to not cover up the fine detail, I would I would go with one of the higher higher number ones. Uh, so the lower number, the thicker it is that would be good for filling uh you know services yep. like we were talking about yeah i just wasn't sure if the 1200 was uh fine enough compared to the 1500 uh i i sprayed the 1200 on this cab yesterday and uh it, it seemed to do a pretty good job i think um I don't know if you you probably won't be able to see the detail but uh uh it, it, it doesn't have much detail this little air conditioner on top say uh shapeways part uh, and it seemed to um, uh, before I sprayed the white on it 
it seemed to uh, not fill in the the all the little great details as bad. So, um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. Anybody else have any other tips and tricks? How about Q and A? Anybody's got to Q and A? Uh, they'd need some help with. Yeah, Reggie. Yeah. So. I'm getting back into soldering with the DCC upgrades and stuff. Um, I'm trying, what do you guys find um, for cleaning your tips, uh, your soldering tips? What, what do you like after you've been, you want to put them away for a little while, you know, take a break, it'll do some other kind of uh, part of your hobby, but what do you find that you clean those with those tips? So you don't have to always buy new ones other than yeah. just a flex dip. Cause a flex dip, it turns it black sometimes, and that's not cool. But you can get the edge on it. So, speed, go ahead. Yeah. Reggie, I will yeah. say, do not clean the tip at all. Okay. Clean, clean the tip next time you heat it up, mm -hmm. before you use it. And okay. do do not get the tip of the thing exposed, so that the tip starts corroding. Ah, uh, okay. Right, because okay. you want to keep that tin on there. Yeah. And there's also a tip tinner, little thing like this, where if you do have some damage, hold on, uh -huh. let me uh, make sure I we see. can focus. Yeah. So you can hold this in there for a few minutes. While you're soldering, I do not wet the sponge because I don't want to change the temperature of the tip suddenly. Okay. I simply use this little, um, I don't know what you call these little things that, here that yeah. you have. On your, on yeah, your I, got, seat for you. I have yes. that, yes. but I, I've seen some use the tip cleaner and then stick it in there, which I think makes a mess no. personally. No. <laughs> no, I would not put any uh, any uh, flux or stuff on the tip if cool. you need to. Okay. So don't gotcha. don't clean it afterwards. Clean okay. it before you use it when it's hot, not while it's cold. While it's cold. Ah, keep thank you. Yeah, keep it keep. tinned. And right. and speed. <clears throat> uh, regarding the use of flux. Thank you. Know that because you've done some soldering here for me on my layout. Uh, you uh, Most of the flux that we buy now has, I mean, most of the solder has flux in it enough to use, correct? So that's the only flux I use is the smoke that sits inside this uh, lead here. Of course, if you use non-leaded, you need to set your temperature of your solder iron warmer as well. But I only go by the flux that's built in here. Uh, Don't buy a solder okay. that doesn't have flux. Now, sometimes you need to heat a big surface up. <coughs> and I just, I just put a, whatever this is, some lubricant. Yeah. Here we go. Here we go. Some, okay. uh, and even when it says no clean, it's get still, rid of the flux. Get rid of flux, okay. Yeah, it will attract flies or something in the future. So clean, clean it off gently and yeah. make sure I, that... I ruined a board <laughs> because there's too much. I mean, I, I thought I had just enough, a little bit of flux, but the flux over time degraded the board. Yeah, and so. whenever I give a, a soldering clinic, I always tell people there are heat sticks, which we all know. You plug them in, the, you get them in the garage in your toolbox and you mm -hmm. plug it into the wall and it heats up. That's called a heat stick. And then there's a temperature-controlled solder iron. You want something that's going to tell you how hot it is. Okay. And you can digitally control this okay. instead of just turning a knob and you don't know if yeah. it's 500 so or something. how hot is too hot for, like, a DCC board, you think? Uh, okay, I would not go number, over. I have a number, like, I keep mine around around 600. Is that too hot? I would go 700 and solder quicker. Okay. Because hey, it's a time heat space thing, so the quicker you can do it, the the warmer you can go. Cool. B, do you have any solder wick there? Real close. Uh, this is another. Are you uh, talking about this? Uh, introduced to yes, right there. This solder wick right there is an amazing product, and what you do, it's it's basically copper webbing that's that's been braided together. And uh, you can lay it down on top of a solder joint and heat heat it up, and this will yeah. suck up all of the solder that's 
um, errant to your solder, all the extra solder, and it just sucks it right up into the webbing and cleans up the solder joint, whether it's on the side of rail, whether it's on a PC board or whatever. It's an amazing tool that you ought to have in your solder kit. Speed, it, go ahead. It, it even has a better feature that it's a hollow, it's like a sheathing, oh, just yeah. like each drink. So it's hollow. So you can put, take the wheel of an axle and shove it through here, cut a little shorter so it doesn't touch the other wheel. And when you solder a tiny little wire to it, you have an electrical pickup from that axle that surpasses oh, wow. normal. That's cool. That's really cool. So keep that in mind. Does that work better than like if you're like on a really tiny, tiny surface and you have to use like one of these suction things? Those suction things are awesome, but they clog up and that, that point of your suction thing is already bigger than it should be. Yeah. And every time you touch it, it melts. The, 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 this works a lot better. Okay. If, you, if, you, if you need to remove a lot of solder, then either heat it all up and shake the thing so the solder mm -hmm. goes to the ground, or you can use that tool that you have there. Okay. Um, I have I two mean, of those, but I haven't used them in the last 10 years. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate now, flux, that. flux. if you put too much solder on and you squirt a little bit of this flux on there, mm -hmm. the flux will also help you remove solder. Like, let's say you solder between a, a chip to a board and there's solder in between the pins. By adding flux, it will help the heat... Um, what I always say is the solder goes to the hottest point, and that's the tip of the solder iron. It goes a lot easier if there's a liquid um, carrier helping helping the solder get there. Well, thank you. That's very helpful. Appreciate that. Anybody uh, else have any other questions? Uh, go ahead, Brooks. Uh, go, going along with the uh, tip, uh, the soldering tips. If you have some that go bad, uh, I've found that this uh, sal uh, solid sal ammoniac is a great. Uh, way to clean the tip and, and restore it. Uh, it helps tin the tip as well. So you, it just is a block, solid block, and you heat the iron up, rub it, put some solder on there, rub it on there. But you want to do this probably outside because it does give off some. Yeah, some I, I've, I've run people out of the house times. before on accident. <laughs> yeah. So So most tips go bad because you bend it. Because you push too hard or you're tapping. It's not a hammer and it's not pliers. All you need is patience, heat, and the solder material on a clean surface. So if you do gentle soldering, then you will almost never have to retin the tip. Gotcha. Thanks. Now, Appreciate 20 years that. later, don't retin the tip. Buy a new tip. Can I buy some of that patience? <laughs> Yeah, and that's, a steady hand. <laughs> steady hand, man. A hard one. <laughs> I was going to ask you, uh, Brooks, what was that? Uh, do you have a link to that uh, stuff you were talking about? Uh, I have some old I'll, tips I would like to resurrect, but... <laughs> I'll, I'll find it online and post it. I, I probably okay. got it on Amazon. So. <clears throat> All right. Thank you both. Thank you. All right, guys. Any other uh, Q&A? All right, we're moving on to show and tell. Anybody else have any show and tell? All hey, Mike, right. Did, hey, Mike, did we yeah. mention uh, D1 member Bob Brendel's article last month? Uh, did not. For those of you who haven't seen it, it's available at your local hobby shop or will be soon, but the new HON3 annual features an article by D1 member Bob Brendel. It's a wonderful article on doing brick buildings. And D3 member Dwayne Richardson has an article in there as well. Yeah, but buy it anyway. Okay, all right. And and uh, Colorado person Mike Condor, does he have an article in there, Mike? Not this year? Not this year. With COVID and job changes and everything, I didn't have time to finish anything up. Next gotcha. year, though. Gotcha. You're typically you contribute. This is the first year you hadn't had an article in there in what? Five years. It's been least, almost yeah. the last, yeah. last one I've put in. Okay, cool. But I had like five years in a row with articles. So yeah. Yeah. You know, so I've got this one article I've been working on for five years and actually never really started it. So it's kind of no, oh, okay. Kind of All right. It's totally totally done in my mind, but you know, sorry, it's not a big yeah. Just need to share that. Okay. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah. 
Peace. I'll give you a piece of my mind. Yeah, that's a good idea. I can't uh, afford anything. Any. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Gordy, <coughs> NMR yes, update. You and Speed. What we got? Me and Speed. Um, yeah. So, NMRX um, for the next three months will take place on the fourth Saturday of the month. So it's the there are a ridiculous number of Saturdays in January this year, but it'll be the twenty third of of January. So two weeks today is that? Yeah. And um, it'll it'll be uh, for eight hours because we simply have too many people wanting to give clinics. Um, so we were going to do it for six, but we had to add an extra couple of hours so we could just get everybody in. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't want more people to do clinics. So we'd love you to get doing clinics. You get offer points or volunteer points, whatever takes your fancy. And points mean, mean prizes, as Dwayne will tell you, and fancy certificates and all that good stuff and letters eventually uh, behind your name. Um, but yeah, so we, we're looking for that. And we've got a special thing this month. Uh, with the Piedmont Division in Atlanta on the 31st of January. Hang on. Let me check that that is the right day. Uh, aye. <laughs> on the 31st of January, um, we're having something. Called, they do something every year called the training camp. And here's the, the real big advantage of doing virtual things is now we can like expand the audience ridiculously uh, to make it a global thing. And what training camp is, is it is a four-hour in-depth session covering all the aspects of if someone has just bought a train set train set for christmas um which i hope everybody bought somebody a train set for christmas right it's it's really important um to keep the hobby going but anyway uh for everyone who's got a train set for christmas you know um what do they need to do to convert that into being a little uh four by eight layout or a tabletop layout of some description so it kind of covers a bit of everything from electronics all the way through um and um so that's that's taking place so it's going to be live streamed. You can also register and be in the in the WebEx. It's going to be on WebEx, not on Zoom, but you can be in the room. Um, I know there's a lot of people interested in getting in the room, so you can be in the room, um, interacting with the clinicians and stuff during the during the session, or you can just watch the live stream. So that's going to be a, a kind of it, it, it's just opening the door, I guess, to doing um, more in depth um, sessions for NMRX, more make and take type of stuff. Um, and then one cool thing I want to mention to everyone because you've probably not seen it on your side of the pond, but Hornby have just released um, a, a range of, of models um, ready to run aimed at under 10s, so young children just getting into the hobby, um, with power on board as standard factory fitted, power on board, magnetic track, no wiring um, to get people going with train sets. So it's kind of like taking the Lionel uh, Magna rail system and... Uh, supplying it with power on board uh, ro uh, rolling stock. So um, that's a very interesting development. There's a YouTube uh, video from Hornby you can go and look at, um, and that stuff should be available for, for Christmas 2021 um, around the world. So it's and it, interestingly, if a, a range of things aimed at young people, it doesn't have any faces on the locomotives. <laughs> so it's quite it's quite interesting it's a real i think it's a huge big development was too there i'm just yeah. trying to figure out what that reference was yeah <laughs> but i mean that's a huge development power on board ready to run as standard from a manufacturer for aimed at people coming into the hobby um is is huge and it obviously it's all controlled well not obviously they've got an android app or something that controls all the trains and, and all that kind of stuff as well as standard but it's it's plug your trains in power on board so if they sell, start selling that separately, that might be uh, that might be really interesting. Cool Darby. deal. Darby. All right, all right, guys. Well, if nobody else has anything, if you do, raise your hand. No. All right. Without further ado, I want to uh, bring forth our our presentation for today. Uh, a gentleman who is a entrepreneur. He owns a company called MacRail LLC. He is also, uh, Reggie, one of your, um, your cohorts over at BNSF. Uh, he is the manager of dimensional clearances, which means that anytime that there is a train that is overweight or high or wide or special uh, handling, then it comes across this man's desk, which to me is a very interesting um, occupation in and of itself. 
Um, but uh, he's done several clinics on uh, NMRAX for Gordy and uh, working in that realm. Uh, without uh, any any further delay, I'd like to introduce uh, Greg McComas. Greg, welcome. We're certainly glad you're here. And he's a D1 member, by the way. So <laughs> welcome. Hey, Greg. Don't don't pull in any support desk calls, and it'll pull me right off this. <laughs> Reggie, Reggie works in the IT department. Yeah. Me. Okay. Yeah. I'm no, on 24 so. seven call. I can sure stop a train if I wanted to. <laughs> yeah, same, same here. This is my, this is my, uh, we're on, there's only just two of us, right. For the whole network. And so we're on seven day call. So this is my, um, I was on two and a half week call for the holidays because he had vacation. So I'm, this is my off week. So I'm kind of enjoying the quiet Saturday. It's just, it's not something crazy, but uh, <laughs> Greg and Reggie, I, I must, I must, in full disclosure, let you know that Mr. Richardson up here uh, thinks that the the letters BNSF stand for been nothing since Frisco. <laughs> Amen, brother. His his uh, his family are long Frisco uh, railroaders, and uh, <laughs> they and and you hold that up there like that. Reggie Dwayne has to reach for the trash can to keep from throwing up. I'm just saying. all right. Hey, I've learned. Hey, I've learned to say Burlington Northern without spitting. I'm okay. sure. All right. You just hadn't got the other part of it yet. It, the Burlington mm. Northern parts where you stop, right? Yeah, well, I don't mind the Santa Fe. They're fine. <clears throat> okay. You know the the irony is, um, you know, I'm in, I'm in a part of AER committees and different committees for dimensional loads and clearance standards, and even with our customers, they go, "Well, what do you think, BN?" And I look around. And I said, "BN, who who are you talking to?" I, oh, oh, me. Oh, I said I work for BN. Yeah. Everyone's, everyone's so lazy. No one wants to say BNSF. They just most things are called BN. So I don't care. They can call whatever they want. Just keep my paycheck coming. So yeah, whatever, they, too, want, whatever they want to call it. But uh, it's too hard for some people to spell. <laughs> uh, I've seen BN. I've seen BSNF, which I'm like, okay, I, I can get behind that one too. That's a, <laughs> there, there's different there's different acronyms for that as well i mean so i'm pretty sure we've used that one a few times but uh anyways i i appreciate everyone uh, uh taking the time today so we'll go through um the michigan air state here i'm going to pull my share my screen here and we'll get this uh party started i know i'm i'm the last thing probably between everyone and lunch so hey we you you've got as much time as you need and I told you I was going to be trying to toss it to you about uh, about eleven, but we got a little bit sidetracked. So. That's okay. It's like Amtrak, a little late. It's all right. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's like TRE. But okay, so we're going to walk through an uh, overview and tour of the Michigan Interstate St. Clair sub. So that's my that's my layout here over in uh, Keller, Fort Worth, whatever you want to call it. We're in a we're in an identity crisis over here. <laughs> When I put Fort Worth on my mailing for buying something, it tells me it's Keller. When I put something Keller on, it tells me it's Fort Worth. So we are in an identity crisis in North Fort Worth. That is what it is. Um, got some social media for it. So I do have a blog. It's been out there since the beginning of the layout. It's got a lot of historical stuff. I've stopped posting to it because I went to Facebook, but I'll probably start using that blog more again here in the future uh, for larger complex uh, posts like uh, an Azotrack signal system, different things. But I leave it up there because there's a lot of great links, a lot of great resources for folks to go back and see as the layouts kind of come from its start to where it is now. A lot of great, uh, a great content. We are also on Facebook, Michigan Air State, St. Clair Sub. I do post in there probably weekly. Um, a lot of fun stuff. And it's just an easy way to, to do it. So, and I know I got a few guys uh, on the chat. I know uh, Brooks and I know Mr. Pearson uh, have operated on the, on the St. Clair. So, it's good to have um, good to have. Well, Don's been, been over to it, and so has Mike. So it's good, to, and, and Bruce as well. So it's good to, to be able to share this, and uh, we'll we'll just jump in here. If you have questions, by all means, we'll stop and we'll answer along the way. It is a, a, a PowerPoint tour of the layout. I'm kind of anchored to this desk. The the room I'm in though is actually the entire layout. So as you can see behind me, the layout's actually above the computer. So it is a full multi-purpose room that's a, an office, a, a playroom for the kids as well, down low, and also a model railroad room. So, Greg, we can't see that uh, view unless you're looking at the gallery view uh, of here. what's behind you while you're sharing your screen. So let me, um, here you go, Colin, I got this. Uh, 
how about this? Can you share this scene? How, how about now? Uh, you got to change the share on your end, not me. You're still sharing the PowerPoint. Yeah, we're still seeing the PowerPoint, Greg. Okay, is that that's? How about now? Do you see the, the yeah, actual? Yeah, no, that's all right. We can look at it after you get through with your PowerPoint. Um. So, are you seeing the PowerPoint? Yes, sir. Okay, what were you looking for, Mike? Oh, you were just talking about your your layout behind you. In the oh, room. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. In the, I'm sorry. I, I'm I'm seeing myself in the the view. So disregard. I'm not the most tech savvy guy. I just I just work for the railroad. So, <laughs> but anyways, um, it's just behind me, and, and we'll see when we continue this conversation. So, uh, getting to getting to the layout tour, we'll talk about me real quick. Uh, the purpose of the Michigan Interstate, right? It's a freelance railroad, so we got to have purpose for that layout and and why does it exist. Uh, and then we'll take a geographic and layout to, uh, overview, kind of set the setting of where we are and kind of get you uh, oriented. Uh, well, then we'll, we'll do a tour. We'll do a west to east tour of the railroad. It is a west to east railroad. Um, um, and then kind of at the end, we'll, we'll just touch on management operations, kind of sharing what, what do I use? You know, a lot of stuff's been, been brought from others uh, and as well, hopefully kind of um, inspiring you and be able to maybe share some of those same same opportunities and topics. So, so a little about me. I've been mile rearing since I was five. Uh, G scale, uh, HO scale. I've been really where I am, and I still have my G. LGB was my first lay, uh, first first um, uh, mile train. And earlier this year, back in June, I did start up MacRail LLC. So it is a um, mile train products and services uh, company here at just a small business here in North Fort Worth. Uh, I do offer around 56 different uh, 3D print, and most of those are finished 3D prints. So uh, our, our, our claim to fame is our removable EO, modern scale EOT. It is a little bit larger than a, a normal EOT uh, by design because it's, it's, its utility is made to be removable for an obsession. So while it does not work, and Ring Engineering has that well locked up in patents for as long as it can be, um, I wanted to, I'm an operator. I'm also, as a modeler, I, also, I wanted a removable EOT to be able to represent having an EOT on a train, a local during a session. Wasn't one, so we brought one to market. And so with that is, is kind of a, you know, adding another layer of, of operations where you're able to put an EOT in your train, twist it into the coupler, put a flag on your train if you need be. And we've also added more accessories, ballast car, solar panels, uh, and different things. And so I have a we are going to have a, a table at Plano. So Chris got me a table for an uh, exhibition. Uh, you can come stop by, see me. Uh, both both days will be there. Uh, Spring Creek Mile Trains does carry our products, so they will be carrying the product at the show, which is really neat. Uh, but if you can't wait till the show, um, coupon code for 10% off any order uh, through, I'm going to do it through the end of the month, um, and the coupon code Lone Star, and that's mackerelproducts.com. Take a look. Everything's always in stock because it's made right here in North Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, it's all handcrafted. Um, we, we really strive to make sure we're, we're serving the modeling community as best as possible with the quality product. So a lot of fun. We do it. We were also in cow catcher, but um, the best part is in taking the product and we test it on the Michigan Interstate St. Clair sub. So we're always testing and always having a good time uh, getting into it. So the Michigan Interstate's purpose, uh, it is a class two regional railroad. Um, and a lot of it's, so we have multiple uh, points of traffic sources. So one of them is, uh, and we'll see in the map here is uh, we get traffic across Mackinac Straits traffic, which dropped in the 80s, but in the freelance, it's still happening. And that's with the Wisconsin Upper Michigan Railroad, which is another freelance railroad out uh, up in Wisconsin, actually, it's actually modeled. Um, also worked this with the CN uh, as a class one. There's a lot of old history, kind of BNSF and MRL. A lot of old history there, so that helps create some overhead bridge traffic. Uh, we do have some online customers on the St. Clair sub that drive a lot of the uh, traffic mix, if you will. So Michigan Sugar has a big sugar beet plant. We'll see that here. There's a lot of traffic that goes into and out of that facility. Uh, Michigan Agricultural Commodities called MAC, um, unit trains of grain, uh, and then Greystone, Greystone Corp, which does cement products. Um, so we have a big cement terminal with the boat. Uh, we'll see that here very shortly. 
We also have some customers being it's a small uh, a layout, we have to use staging to help um, enhance the customer traffic levels. So we have Dow Chemical uh, and Fort Mackinac paper that are offline industries via stage and help us create a larger traffic base that does flow across the St. Clair sub. So that's kind of set the purpose of why it exists as a regional class two. And uh, we'll look into to the, the geography of the actual uh, layout. So looking at the it kind of set the place uh, in the actual in Michigan itself, it's kind of like a, a wishbone, right? Uh, Mackinac City to the north, and then as you can see up in the Upper Peninsula, that's actually the Wisconsin Upper Michigan, and we connect with them. Or we're primarily in the lower Lower Peninsula, and that's kind of set the entire regional right, railroad. So while the Saint Clair sub is one small 120 mile ish portion of the railroad, um, I modeled then 30, 35 miles ish is what the model. So the model portion kind of starts at Bay City. Uh, to the west and then works east toward Port Huron through a few towns. Um, being it's a, you know, a smaller layout, we, it's a little bit more compressed, but we're still able to get some awesome runs in with a helix that really takes and makes and elongates the run for, uh, for uh, operators. So it's a 13 by 12 room, double deck. Um, we use DTC, so direct traffic control dispatching and ABS. Uh, there is an ABS uh, overlay of signals in some part of the railroad. Uh, we use JMR operations for the car forwarding. During a session, we'll move around 130, 140 cars. So the tra the railroad is very busy during a session. We'll operate 10 to 12, 12 to eh, 12 to 14 trains in a session. And trains are around 12, 10, 11 to 12 cars long. Um, we make that look longer because we have use a lot of curves uh, built into the layout structure itself. So you don't really see the entire train at once. And so it feels longer than what it is. And we, and we can operate anywhere from one to five operators. It's, so it can be sequential up to one person, it, it can go long. Um, and that's really designed as flexibility uh, based on different things. Like right now, it's just been me <laughs> working sequentially. Um, and there is a video tour from NMRAX on the 712, uh, the day of 712, there is a video tour of the NMRAX that you can, you can take a look at from a more video perspective. But for this, for this uh, tour, we're just going to do PowerPoint kind of step by step from tour the railroad. So, so looking at the uh, the actual model section, so we have West Staging, which is where we start at. It's four tracks, represents Mount Mackinac City, Mount Pleasant, Grandpa's kind of points west, right? Um, then we come on stage or on layout at Bay City, uh, and that's where the epicenter of operations at, on St. Clair sub take. There's around uh, four terminators, four originators there. There's a few block swaps that happen. Two or three locals originate from Bay City. So a lot of, a lot of work happens. There is a dedicated yard switcher. Um, the, the operation does build 12 blocks on six tracks. So it requires a yard master to be very uh, creative with his space and his time and what he's doing with his uh, operation. And then we'll move out of the layout. Um, as we kind of move up the layout, we move up the helix, which is two towns not modeled. Um, they're just represented by the helix itself. Uh, and then the train come back on layout on the upper deck at Upper Huron, where there is a, a branch line, like a small staging for a branch line, a full operational Y. And then, of course, one of the biggest traffic generators on the layout, the Michigan Sugar Plant. And I remember Tom, when he was here some time ago, Tom actually had a chance to work the sugar turn uh, that serviced uh, that plant. Uh, Gray's Lake, as we continue across the layout, Gray's Lake, there's a road switcher based at Gray's Lake that serves three or four industries. Um, they're online there. Merchandise trains coming through make a block set out of cars. That local then service is very similar to um, Roanoke, Texas, where the UP will come through and make a block set out and the local will service those cars, pick them up, deliver them, and then also then set out the poles uh, for the next road train to come through and pick them up. So we add a, a variety of operations to the layout to, um, to give the operators interest part is part of it. Uh, Gearhard, a couple of industries there. And then basically the layout goes off into staging, which is East staging. And there's three tracks represents our points East, such as Port Huron, Detroit, um, Canada, and even going to Toledo, Ohio. So here's kind of, the, we're, we're gonna jump right into the tour now. And so we're gonna look we're going from east, from a west to east across the railroad. 
And so right here, we see one of the focal key elements of, of really setting the place of this uh, layout. And this is the uh, freelance modeling of the Saginaw River uh, in Michigan, which is actually traversed by, by, by ships, lake freighters. And it's actually a swing bridge. And so right here, this is where the layout comes on scene or comes on layout from West Staging. So it kind of approaches up and it, there's some trees help us kind of come on layout. And this here is a really neat scene. Um, the, the water I think is really kind of cool. It's actually at Woodland Scenics Just Port, including this part and where the lake freighter sits. It took 14 kits poured in about a five minute interval <laughs> uh, to get that to get that pour. And that's about a quarter inch thick. So that's a really good, um, a really good product that turned out really well uh, for the scene. Uh, and that's, it's a fantastic scene. Folks get to see this when they first come in uh, to the layout. So as we come across the bridge, we're heading eastbound. And right now the train, unfortunately you see, we're looking west. And so on each photo, I do provide what view we're looking at. So right now we're looking westbound, but for the tour, for this tour, we're gonna go actually east. So it will become kind of behind us uh, and heading into uh, Bay City. So here we just come off the bridge and we begin a, a right-hand turn um, toward the Bay City Yard. And one of the things right here, is this is actually the River Industrial League. And so um, it's materialized into basically the Greystone Marine Terminal, Greystone Cements Marine Terminal. Oh, that's great. And yes, sir. The, here's someone. Okay. Um, and so basically what you see here is a five foot long lake freighter. This is a, a Barico Marine kit, which is a vacuum form plastic, essentially scratch building <laughs> of a lake freighter. And this is in progress, but um, uh, this is a cement facility, basically Marine, you know, the boats, the cement freighter brings in uh, bulk cement, it's stored in silos, and then it goes out via rail distribution points uh, across the nation. So that's a, um, had his own track mobile. So during a session, if I really want to make someone suffer, I'll go make him use a track mobile. at one car at a time. And that's, uh, that's always fun to move, <laughs> move cars around at the uh, facility. So coming into uh, the Bay City Yard, and it's hard to capture the whole Bay City Yard really in one photo, which it's, it's in a curve. But it's a six track yard. Uh, it's got a main and a passing track on the back end. And so during a session, we're gonna turn this yard over at least once. Um, everything will flush through, come through. We have some diesel holding tracks for you know basic servicing, essentially, uh, in between runs. Um, and this is where a lot of the, a lot of the, the epicenter of the layout really happens is at Bay City Fogel Singer Yard. And I say Fogel Singer Yard because for a long time, for about ten years, a gentleman in Michigan named Fred Fogel Singer, who actually lived in Bay City, um, was my custom painter. Uh, he actually passed earlier in 2020, and so as part of a uh, um, and he was very involved with the Saginaw River Valley Model Railroad Club. And so part of, um, you know, paying tribute to Fred is, is the yard was renamed the Fogelson Yard in 2020, um, honoring his, uh, his skill in the hobby. So as we kind of keep, we're kind of still heading east now, we continue kind of curving around the yard. The yard really is a big, a long, elongated U, if you will. So we got some curved uh, yard ladders, which people love and hate, but for the space situation, it works out. And so it's kind of just photos here, um, just seeing that, you know, we're looking at one photo here to the left of the, the aces in the photo. And then the next photo is a little bit further down, kind of showing how the yard just kind of just wraps itself around uh, the curve as we head east out of Bay City and head toward the helix. So right here, this is a kind of interesting, it's not, it's an unfinished scene, but it's coming, it's getting there. Uh, and this is basically the, the east end of Bay City Yard, or I'm sorry, Bay City, uh, basically our east yard ladder. So look at the tracks in front of you, you got the front track, that's your yard lead. And then you have your main line, um, your passing sign, which has a concrete ties. And that track in the background, that's actually our Essexville branch. And while there's actually not a branch modeled, um, there's enough, track there to hold one full train for a, a local essentially. And this track also doubles over as a continuous run at a lower level. Um, and so uh, I could put in the lift out section, which I didn't show, but I can put in lift out section and essentially I can run trains on both upper deck and lower deck in a continuous remote configuration, whether I'm uh, breaking a locomotive in or whatever it is in that situation. Um, 
and it also allows me during an operation session to stage a, a local that comes to and from the, the Essexville branch essentially um, and operate. So it, it, I like having, especially having, you know, young kids, they like to run trains. And so having a continuous run allows me to get one up there and let him run it while I'm tinkering on something else in the layout room or working on engines or whatever it is. Um, and that's, that's a, for me, that was a, a, a necess a need uh, on the, and having. So as we, we're almost out of Bay City, it just keeps going, but uh, this is where the yard leads and the main line come back together here at the far east end. And we have a, um, a shot of like the, the overpass, which helps kind of transition this out of, out of Bay City. We have Fort Mac on paper, which has been a really neat, this was a COVID build actually. I started back in March on this one. And this is a Wathers kit. It's been kind of um, engineered to fit the space. And basically it's a, 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 you know, a corrugated plant. So we get in liner board uh, and makes out corrugated you know, boxes essentially. Um, and so the interior, we modeled it. So we got some, and this is really kind of genesis, the 3D prints is we did 3D, print, we 3D printed paper rolls. And cause we needed, we needed about 150 to fill the warehouse. So we went ahead and did that and that kind of genesis, okay, well we can do other things with 3D prints and just really took us into Mac rail later in the, in the year. But um, it's got a Lego roll up door on it. So the door actually does operate. <laughs> Adding so in the local or the yard job that spots this facility, they actually got to stop. They got to pull the job card, uh, which you can see on the fascia. Then they actually have to lift the, the Lego door um, adding to the, to the element of operations, like a, a switcher would if they were going to a, a inside facility as such. So here we have our helix. It's a four turn helix. Uh, and also, as we can see here, there are some signal systems. So right here uh, on the lower, the first level, that's actually the, the initial signal. And this is where um, the ABS overlay starts and it will actually go from here uh, all the way to Gearhart, which it will go to East staging essentially. And so we do have part of the layout ABS signal. And we actually, um, if you look at my blog on, um, we actually went through a five or six step installation of the Azatrac signal system. And every, every post was a little bit more complex and we added to the signal system to get it where it is now. Um, and that's available, you can see that on the, on the blog. That was, that was a fantastic uh, project back in 2016. And um, the, the, the really having a smaller layout in a smaller room, while I do eat up a lot of space with the Helix, you know, to, give in, to give and take, I do gain a lot of run. I mean, you definitely almost add a third extra run to the layout by having a helix. And so part of it is I open the helix up so you can actually see the trains as they traverse, um, adding to adding to the operation and adding to the run itself. So it's not just flat land railroading. Um, there are, there's a grade 2.5%. So people have to be cognizant um, handling their trains going up and down the helix. Uh, coming on, on layout on the upper deck is that upper Huron. Um, and this is where we have the Y. And of course that Y, the, the tracks kind of leads out off layout there to your left. That's actually your, your, um, your west leg of the Y. And that wraps around and we'll see it again. It ties into um, uh, basically an upper level continuous run. And so then you have the, the other back part of the Y, the east leg of the Y behind the water tower there. And then the sugar beet plant actually comes off of that. And so the local the, the services, the sugar beet plant actually takes the west leg. Once their shoving platform clears the far switch, then they shove back. And they do all their work there at, um, at the sugar plant. So it's a, it's a neat scene. There's some neat, and it's just, this is about, if I'm six foot three, um, the tracks, the concrete tie tracks you see below, they're about eye level. And so they are section some super elevation in those curves. And so you get some really neat, uh, some really neat views as you're operating your train. And for the for the folks that are actually unfortunately in high challenge, they're not six foot three like, like myself. I built the layout too. We have uh, very large wooden boxes that are that are reinforced, and so they're they're positioned around the layout so folks can stand on them, and one have a good footing so they won't fall, but then it allows them to also it elevates them, you know, a, a solid foot. So they have a better view and a better ability to reach into the layout, whether switching or operating. Hey, uh, Dwayne, that means you can come over and operate whenever you'd like. 
<laughs> yeah. So uh, don't want to don't want to not talk about Michigan Sugar because it's 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 a very big focal point industry and it's a large traffic generator on the layout, um, and it's still very much a work in progress with uh, a mixture of kit bashing and probably some scratch building there to get get the scene like I want. Um, but this will eat up an entire this this facility on, during a session will will take in probably twelve to fourteen cars and it will kick out twelve to fourteen cars. So the local will be very busy. I mean, it brings in coal and coke and sugar beets during the campaign. It ships um, in molasses, sugar, beet pulp, and pellets as well. So it has its own plant switcher, uh, which is a form of cores engine, which is pretty neat. Um, and so this will keep someone busy uh, for a part of the session. So we have not, it's, it's been, we've kind of done it part time essentially. So, like the local operator who works the sugar turn. When he comes up to uh, Upper Huron, he, stop, he parks his train. He then also works the plant switcher uh, independently. Then he goes back to Sugar Turn. The, the intention is um, there'll be enough work in the future as we kind of continue ramping up traffic levels that that will be um, almost a dedicated job for someone to operate the sugar, the sugar plant switcher um, without having to do any other uh, tasks uh, at the same time. So it'll probably take him half a session to you know, work the inbounds and outbounds. Um, but in the track, in the track setup is still kind of a, in a to be determined, trying to make sure we're getting the most, getting the best track layout uh, for the uh, setup and the location. So um, as we, as we come across here, so which is actually the French door. So it's the double French door opening uh, to the layout. And this part here was actually meant to be a removable section. Uh, however, my wife is 5'2", so I built the layout to be just tall enough that she can walk in and out of the office <laughs> without having to have this thing removed. So she said, keep it in. So it's permanent. <laughs> it's permanent. Of course, it's duck hunter for me, but um, it's a fantastic, it's a finished scene. This is the Cass River, uh, in which is actually a river in Michigan, mid-Michigan, in the thumb, uh, with some canoers on it. And it was, a, it was a lot of fun to model. And it's the first thing that folks get to see when they walk into the layout room. This is looking them dead in the eyes and they get to see a, a fantastic scene with a lot of trees, a lot of depth. Um, and it really, and even for people who are not mothers, it's, it's a wild point because people are able to see where, how you're able to capture um, such a realistic scene, you know, with using in Mile River. People just don't see that. So it's for, for folks that aren't Mile Riverers, it's also opportunity. It's a great opportunity to get some education and what does our hobby do? You know, how and how we're able to recreate amazing scenes like this. So, so we come into, once we cross the Cass River, we come into, which is used as a scenic block between sides of the layout, because um, we're short on space, we come into the town of Gray's Lake. Um, and so behind Gray's Lake is I have a very large display shelf. So for, for storing, uh, you know, my officer special. I also have quite a few dimensional loads up there. I mean, I can't be a dimensional manager at the railroad and not model high wides. So I have a wind train, Schnabel car, transformer, uh, pole loads um, that run on occasion. But uh, Gray's Lake is a, a really neat little town. The railroad kind of wraps around it. Uh, and there is a, a local switcher based here. Uh, and there are three industries. There's a fertilizer facility, uh, a cooperative elevator. So there's outbound uh, beans and, and grains. And there's also then an LPG uh, transload terminal, which you, which you can see below. So it's it's mostly finished. Um, and that will keep some busy for a part of the session working the, the local that's uh, based out of Grace Lake. So to move along from Gray's Lake, we come to one of the major meet and pass locations on the railroad. So there's two sidings that are designed um, for, um, for making full train meets. So the first one is that Bay City itself. So behind the yard, there, there is a, a main one and a main two essentially. And those are about 20 cars long. So we can make a full meet of a train uh, at Bay City going before going to and from staging. But then also on the upper level, we added, uh, a, there's a second uh, siding. This is gray siding, which is also around uh, 16 cars long. And so it allows for a full train, for full train meets, basically, uh, and depending on the size of the train, almost like a rolling meet. Um, 
And so in the, you get in the, in the background, you have the concrete tie, which is a main line. Then you have the siding, which is wood tie in the uh, foreground. And then uh, there's a third track there. And that's actually, the, we call that the local track. And that's where road trains there, that have blocks of cars for Grays Lake, they will come to a stop on the siding and they'll make a pickup and a set out um, based on whatever the local has worked. And so that's what that, that's what that, I guess that foreground track is used for um, is, is really for that pickup and set out work, but uh, it's a great scene. So as you kind of transition, you know, we use really try to use curves uh, on the layout design itself and layout track work to help create distance, create space. Um, and, and really also then try to make the best of using a backdrop. So like the, the, what you can see in the backdrop is a cornfield. That's actually the, a Blueford shops cornfield. And that's actually a curved backdrop. And so, you know, it was really, uh, you know, with photographic backdrops being what they are now, they've come a long way since I did this scene, you know, really now you can, you can really use backdrops to help you have a, a great looking scene depth without having to sacrifice a ton of space. And, um, and a lot of times, depending on how I get the camera angle, you can even, it will trick your eyes and figure out where does the cornfield start and where does it end um, with the backdrop, which, which helps once again, you know, you're, you're working on a scene and you're working that area, uh, you stay focused on, on that part of the layout you're in. And additionally with that, you're having kind of a little coves, right? So if you're working in the yard or working in certain areas, you're kind of in a little cove of the layout um, you're, you're more focused right there in that, in that probably that four to five foot area you're working in versus, oh, well, you know, there's another town right behind me. Um, you don't really focus on the other town because you're, you're really kind of immersed in the scene you're in, which, uh, which is a lot of fun. And then gear, how I couldn't have, I could not forget to put this picture in of the, of the incident we had with the DP engine here a while ago, but um, another, just another shot, kind of that gray sighting. So it kind of, once it, it, it works itself around. Uh, Gearhart is still in the process of being um, created. It's probably gonna be more of a backdrop town, um, right as you transition into east staging. But uh, basically, that's where the siding ends. So the siding comes back to the main line. So the concrete ties is your main line. And looking at the lower photo, photo, uh, photo to the right, <laughs> we had a we had a DP train, and it was in the siding, and we were doing some work. And we forgot to unlink the DP, which happens in the real life. And that DP wandered out and struck a, a train that was passing. So why not? It's, it's, a, it's a fantastic shot. It catches uh, what, what Gearhart looks like. And so that, that track to the right, I had talked about continuous runs, that track to the right of the, uh, of, of the 7052 you see, that is used for the local um, during this op session, that's used as like a long lead. So they can work the siding um, and the local track without interfering with the main line. It also allows um, for the um, for a continuous run upper level. So this track to the right, it loops behind the helix uh, and actually connects back in with that west leg of the Y that we originally saw upper here on. And so it allows you to have, especially with the upper level, you have a, a continuous run at any time that's not interfered with well, having to move a lift, lift out section. The lower level, has a lift out section I have to put in if I want to make continuous running or run around, but the upper deck can be run at any time. I mean, that's, that's great. Cause I'll do it. I'll go work on a DCC install uh, and I'll bring it in here. And then um, I need to test it out. I want to do some load tests. I want to do some, do some break in runs with it. And that's always, that's always readily available to use the upper, the upper level. So if you guys uh, get the, the uh, cow catcher magazine from Tim Blackwell, be sure to look out for this next month. He uh, has a really good article about, I helped him uh, get his Santa Fe locomotive up to specs for his North Tarrant Pacific uh, and kind of a uh, little bit of Santa Fe heritage and some uh, some work to really bring that engine to life for his layout, his for his shelf layout there he has for doing his product demos. And we spent a lot of time on that uh, engine just doing test runs uh, on the upper level. So it's a, it's a great layout to have. And even with being a small layout, it's we got a lot of stuff done. Greg, I thought that picture down the lower right was uh, trying to demonstrate your rotary dump on those hoppers. No, yeah. <laughs> no, that was, uh, yeah, th th that one, that was, uh, I, I, 
quite a few of my uh, friends that are a prototype, you know, they're engineers and conductors. They, <laughs> they had some interesting comments on that one, but I said, yep, this is like the real one. We forgot to unlink the DP. So, yeah, I mean, you couldn't ask for a better shot of the cars, the rotary dump cars almost trying to, well, self dump themselves. So, so from a train management side, uh, the layout says flexible. It can operate with one individual or up to five. Um, and depending on how we operate, it depends on really the order of operation. So if I do one operator like myself, like I've been doing here with COVID, it's sequential, right? So one, one, one train at a time, full schedule. It'll probably take me about a month to, to do the whole layout because not only am I running the trains, I'm working the locals, I'm switching the yard. Um, <laughs> it's time. Uh, two or three operators, no dispatcher. And so one of the things on the fascia is there's little DTC signs around the layout. It's broken the DTC blocks. And on the fascia, there is these DTC cards. And I'll show the example below. And I give it uh, credit to Chip Cole on his CSX uh, Plymouth sub up in, Mich up in Ohio. He had that for a long time. I just use that idea. And so basically it's a Velcro um, track and time basically. And so if you're in this certain block, if you're in the bay one block, you pull that DTC card off the fascia. You have authority to be in that block. So if someone else is operating and they come up to the bay one sign and they go to get that bay one DTC card and it's not there, they're not permitted to enter that, that block with authority. And so then they have to wait until they get the, uh, the actual that block to operate or they communicate with the operator that's in that block to ensure that uh, they know of, you know, conflicting movements or whatever it is. So I can operate two or three guys like that without having to worry about having a dispatcher. And it's kind of, uh, it kind of self-manages the layout because it's a regional. So, you know, it's not uh, high pace Amtrak class one type railroading, but we do still have a lot of trains out running around the layout. Um, we do use JMR operations. So I took a screenshot here kind of showing you of what um, this is a, this is a typical session, you know, so we have, uh, builds for all the local, all the manifest freights, the locals, the yard job, uh, that works locals. And of course, then the actual plant switchers at Greystone and at Michigan sugar, they'll actually have work orders printed, uh, for what they need to do. So we get more operators, four to five operators right now. We do now we have a local dispatcher and basically we have a, right now it's a simple, it's a simple diagram to lay out, lined out, and we use uh, uh, Sharpies or like your dry erase markers on plexiglass. And the dispatcher just, he plans how he wants to release the railroad and let it run. Um, and that's, a, that's an interesting job. And even for being a small layout, this will keep a dispatcher busy for a lot of during the session because we'll input things like track and time or situation. So we, we add more to the operation than just running from A to B. Um, to really make it more like the road, like the prototype. And then one thing we're hoping to do in the future is the remote dispatcher. I know I had a chance to operate with speed and we had Gordy dispatching from uh, across the pond. That was really cool. And I thought that was a really neat opportunity. And so we hope to, um, and I'm hoping to do something similar with uh, some friends in Virginia and having, uh, having that person dispatch remotely whenever we do our next session here, uh, probably later in, in 2021. And I know there was a there was an MR article about remote dispatching, and it's you know it's gone tenfold from what I'm trying to do, but uh, with with folks virtually operating trains and whatnot, and we haven't got to that part, but that's that's definitely there's a lot of great stuff out there for virtually operating on layouts. So talking about maximizing layout space, so I took some photos. The photo to your left, yeah, there's Brooks in there, but that was a uh, that was from the most recent Fort Worth layout operations day, I think, or, or I'm sorry, the DFW interchange we had last year. Uh, that was from, we had, I had two sessions that day. And then um, the photo to your right, that's just, that's kind of my normal pool crew. I'd say the local, uh, local guys that uh, uh, stuff in there and make them work. And so, you know, a lot of us are big guys, you know, none of us are small by any means. And uh, we're able to fit into that area uh, very well. And so, as you can see the room, it kind of get a sense of, it's, it's, luckily it's a very tall room. It's a 10 foot ceiling. So it doesn't, um, it doesn't feel crowded from a height perspective, but um, you can see that you know, the layout itself is wrapped around the outside perimeter of the, of the room. 
use a lot of curves to help with those um, coves, right? So people can kind of get into those coves and leave out extra space. And I mean, really the layout just envelops the entire room. And it's, and it's kind of in a, um, a photo box or I guess a shadow box set up, right? So we had the fascia, you know, not only on the sides of both upper deck and lower deck, but we also have a, a finished fascia on the top. So it kind of hides the LED lighting and creates more of a shadow box look uh, on the layout. And just uh, kind of wrapping up here with a few documentation purposes. So operators get a copy of a timetable. Uh, they get information provided to them uh, about the train, you know, symbology of the, of the railroad, right? And then also what does a symbol detail, you know, I could have, you know, whatever train it is, but I understand what, what does it mean? And so uh, we try this all operators to get an understanding of what the symbols mean and kind of walking through the, the uniqueness of it for the Michigan interstate. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of documentation as well. So on the fascia with every industry uh, and at every station, there are uh, track diagrams. And so here's an example of Bay City. This on the east end Bay City, Bay City has three different diagrams. You have a yard, west, west side, you have the main yard itself, and then you have the east end. And so what we see here is actually the east end, which is the east yard lead, um, the Fort Mackinac paper facility, main one, main two, and of course the Essexville branch. And this is kind of focused on that one area and it kind of helps you know where you are on the layout. And then for the operators that work the um, actual industries, there's also a little industry card, a little, like a little business card holder on the fascia. There's a little uh, laminated business card and it will, or a little industry card. And it essentially tells the operator what they need to know for servicing that industry, right? So it's not their work orders. Their work orders will tell them what they're gonna spot and pull based on JMR operations, but this helps them know um, what they're gonna do. So, you know, you're gonna pull your empties from the, you know, first you're gonna pull your empties and then you're gonna spot three car, 50 foot cars inside, you know, and then of course you can't have any locomotives inside the actual facility itself. So if you only had one car to spot, you may need to have other cars used as a handle. And so it just it allows operators to kind of know what they need to do and where they need to go with the cars. Um, very similar to job aids that a lot of prototype railroads use for their locals and their road crews, uh, knowing how to service an industry. And then uh, probably like this last is train documentation. So uh, locomotives are all put in consist. They're all set up in advanced consist. So I use Digitracks. Uh, system, also the JMRI interface, PR3, and a Linwee. So I have multiple ways you can use your phone or a throttle to operate the layout. Um, but everything is built into consist. And so I got some John Parker on the BNSF Fall River Division. And a real nice, once again, like a little laminated car, a little paper car, because I do change out the consist on occasion, knowing what engines are my consist and then what are my functions? Because everything, everything being operated has sound. It all has to be all, it's all sound tracks equipped. Uh, and so then knowing what functions are set up for um, sound is, is, you know, helps the operator so they can, they can add that element as they're operating the layout. So um, one thing I'm gonna be changing here on this is we're going to one horn only. So short horn, long horn, will go to long horn only. Um, and so just like a prototype, you only had one horn, you gotta be able to quill it properly uh, if you're gonna use the horn. So we're gonna be changing that up here in the future. Um, and then every, every train itself, so there, you know, there's obviously the trains in JMRI operations, the assignments, but then every train has a train card and it tells folks, you know, how they're gonna, where they're gonna pick the train up at, uh, what they need to do with that train, how they, where it operates to what, and then what DTC blocks they'll need to be requesting from the dispatcher as they operate over the railroad. And so on the back of this train car, this is like a pamphlet, it's folded over and it's laminated. There's a, a DTC quick reference block card. It's right here actually on the front where it's the front of this um, um, train information car where it says MPB, PHBA, it says manifest port here on the Bay City. Right below that, is the uh, DTC block reference card. So people can see the entire layout um, and all the DTC blocks, four letter digit or four letter abbreviations, they can see the entire layout um, in order 
to know where they are in regards to DTC, especially for folks that had not operated on the layout before. Um, it can become intimidating if you don't want to know what you, where you are and what you're doing. And so making sure folks have the best information um, have helps uh, helps with that. So, so one of the things uh, in 2021 we're going to be trying to bring in is night operations. So I have blue light pucks all around the layout. They're all remote controlled, um, and some adding some lighting in. And with ditch lights and, and LEDs and most locomotives, they're very strong. Um, so with the blue lights, you can really help bring night operations to life and a different element to the layout, which uh, we're hoping to do. And that that's about it. So um, I'm open for any questions anyone has uh, on the tour or the operations management perspective of, uh, of the Michigan Air State St. Clair sub. Well, Greg, uh, how how big is the room overall? Uh, it is a uh, twelve by thirteen. Uh, does your Facebook have a track plan or? It does. Diagram? Yeah, it does. So actually, uh, if you go to the Facebook, I'll um, I'll repost it again today. But it's in the photos. I actually drew a track plan, uh, upper and lower deck track plan. I should and I should have put it in the uh, the tour. But uh, yes, there is a track plan. Uh, as well of the layout. Mm -hmm. Hey, Greg, yes. I, was, I want to tell you, um, I'm a graphical visual artist and I like how your, your backgrounds had depth. In other words, it wasn't just a, a flat, I mean, when I say flat, I mean, it's flat, but it has a depth. It pulls the eye out. And the first thing your brain has to do instead of bounce, it looks at that depth and says, whoa, wait, and your brain registers, oh, that's a layout. But it it's really cool. I, I like how you did that. With your, Thank you. With the yeah, so, uh, the, you have, so. Yeah, so the, the backdrop. So some of them came from Scenic King, uh, and unfortunately they they closed up shop. I know uh, Mile Train Crossing and Hearst still has quite a few of them in stock, uh, and they did some really nice prints. And then I also worked with uh, Backdrop Junction out of uh, I think New Hampshire, and we had done. He does some really nice photographic scenes, and it's really come. And it's really come a long way. Um, you know, when I first started the layout and started doing the scenes are more, I think, more like artworkish type images. But I mean, they've really come full circle now. It's, you know, it's the it's a full photograph and he's backed. Um, and I, and I use the, and I use it where I just have a, a real simple uh, light blue gray backdrop. And then I, I just cut the actual scene out and lay it on her. So it's kind of, it kind of pops us slightly. Uh, I know some folks use a whole screen, you know, the whole, you know, 12 foot or 12 inch tall rollout. And it's really, you know, it's really up to, you know, let's say it's, it's to each one. I probably would do the same thing now going back and do it again. But uh, yeah, and take the backdrops have just added. So thank you. But they, yeah, they have added such a, um, a depth to the scene and it really, it really helps bring it all together. Absolutely. So thank you, Reggie. Uh, Greg, how long have you been working on the layout or when do you start building it? Oh, this layout here. Um, let's see. Probably about uh, 2010. So about 10 years. So it should move, should move, should move a lot faster than I have. I mean, it, uh, <coughs> I mean, operationally, it was actually operational doing op session. We started, I think, 2014. Um, so, started actually doing op sessions. So we had most of this stuff in, you know, track works probably about 99% complete other than the sugar beet plant kind of roughing in that track will be the end of it. Um, and then really now it's, it's, um, it's going to be a full on dash to 2023. So with the national 2023 coming, you know, uh, goals are always good because they encourage um, progress. <laughs> you know, so like the DFW air change encouraged some progress to get done um on some parts of the layout and then of course with the national coming in 2023 this layout will be fully completed um by by the national so that's that's the goal so you're assuming that this layout's going to be on the national tour I, well I, I guess yeah i hope so throwing it out there <laughs> <you know. laughs> but but even you know it kind of depends if, if not you know at least um i think that's a good that's a good hard um 
date, you know, because folks, you know, even if it's not, it's not on a tour for say, for some reason, um, you know, I, folks, I, I have no doubt. Okay, right. thanks. <laughs> but it, it's definitely it's you know, I mean, that's what two and a half years away. I mean, it's not very long, um, and so we got some we got some work to do. But uh, that's that's all in the fun of uh, of having a layout. So COVID will be cured hey. by twenty twenty three. Hey, hey, Greg. I hope, yeah, I, I hope so. But, you know, I, I will say, co you know, trying to find the silver lining in COVID, uh, I've got a lot. Um, there's been a lot of work done on the layout, you know, making some big pushes to get like the, the Fort Mackinac paper plant. I, I, it, it had been a rough format from the box, but, um, you know, I was able to I just took the step and said, no, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and kit bash it today. It's going to be done. And then by the end of the weekend, it needs to be painted and it needs to be roughed in. And so by the next week, then we were putting the, we were putting the interior in. So, um, yeah, it, it really has helped kind of push, and, you know, in a safe way that I get the, get the, get the layout uh, more toward the finished product. Hey, Greg. Hey, Bruce. Yeah. Um, I just went and looked at Backdrop Junction's website. And apparently they're going out of business. Uh, they said that they're only not accepting new orders and anything that they've got, they're going to sell. And uh, uh, the only thing that's listed is a handful of uh, HO scale backdrops. Yeah, I saw that. So I, I had, I had been, I had lucked out with him right before he decided to close up shop. I had made an ah. order um, about, I guess about a year and a half ago. Ironically though, when COVID first hit, I know the gentleman who runs that store runs it. He's actually a pilot for jet blue full time. Mm -hmm. I know that he was, uh, I think on furlough for a while there. So he did actually restart the business um, for about six months. I mean, it, it was real ad hoc, but I know, you know, bad hoc, backdrop junction was a great supplier. Um, I know there's trained junkies. So if y'all have ever seen Dean Ferris's layout, he's got a lot of backdrop and I know he had trained junkies do a lot of um, uh, a custom mix of using their product and his product to kind of create a, a fantastic looking, like three or 400 feet of, <laughs> backdrop um, and then there are so i think uh, track side senior there's a there's still some great other other products out there that are similar but uh yeah it's, it's unfortunate that, that you know we've lost some good backdrop manufacturers that were making some very nice photographic backdrops at a, at a decent price point you know i mean you're talking mm -hmm. 12 12 feet of backdrop for probably around 80 bucks but it, yeah, was, a, you know, it was a vinyl adhesive that literally you peeled it and it sticks i mean it's not coming off that, that, uh, that Masonite board or fascia. So, yeah. All right. Thanks. Yes, sir. Anybody else? All right. Well, Greg, uh, if you don't mind, <clears throat> first off, great presentation. I hope everybody appreciated it. Give, give uh, Greg a round of applause, if you would, virtually. You can, everybody can <laughs> do that. Uh, also, um, Greg, if you don't mind sticking around just for a minute after the meeting, I wanted to go over a couple things with you, if you don't mind. Sure, sure. Um, if nobody else has anything else, uh, it's been a, a great meeting. We're coming up right on 1230, which is our normal cutoff time. So uh, you guys uh, look forward to seeing you next month. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, we've already gotten a teaser for it. Bruce is doing a clinic for us on DCC. So I'm, I'm anxious to see what all he's talking about with boosters and that, uh, the topic of DCC has, uh, is, is deep and wide and has a lot of breadth to it. So, uh, we could be talking about simply decoders, or we could be talking about command stations, or we could be talking about boosters, or we could be talking about wiring, all different types of things. So uh, I'm anxious to see what Bruce is going to lay out for us. Uh, in uh, As with anything, uh, hope to see you guys at the Plano show. If you're uh, so inclined and, and uh, everybody be COVID responsible, uh, look forward to, uh, <coughs> to, uh, Talking to you guys, if you have any questions, you got any suggestions for the uh, the division, please reach out to me. I'm always looking for it. And uh, again, I want to put out a call to anybody who could uh, possibly help us on the website. That would be uh, a, uh, a huge benefit. 
I know Mr. Corley would appreciate the help and we'd like to get somebody put in there. Uh, one final thing, Gordy, <coughs> based on your yep. uh, understanding, um, I think you and I had some discussions about this um, a little bit. You're sure changing your look there, Gordy. You got a lot more hair <laughs> now than you did. Oh, wait a minute. That, I see now. Look, we're we're uh, who is that? Who are we looking at? Oh, this is this is Dabba, the furry, my little furry assistant. Who, okay. Uh, all right. Good. Who deal. has just been just been sitting in front of the screen <laughs> all the way through most of Greg's presentation, cool. but, uh, watching cool. the whole thing. He, he he likes his ops. He's available for remote dispatching. He's very quiet. <laughs> Two wolves for stop, right? That's it. So the thing I wanted to talk to you about, mm -hmm. uh, with COVID as it is, with the 2021 convention, mm -hmm. uh, California on lockdown, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, uh, is it look like we're going to probably – be postponing the 21 convention in the the rails by the bay what's the story on that as we speak official the, the the official story and nothing else has been discussed about canceling it at this point it is going ahead um there'll be it'll be uh, it'll go ahead i doubt there'll be home layout tours i doubt there'll be home uh obsessions at home and stuff um oh. it's going ahead um of course Y'all should know me well enough by now. I have a backup plan, but um, it's going head uh, face to face. I, I won't be there. Um, I can guarantee that um, with your new president, I will not be allowed to enter your country. So um, quite rightly to, for COVID uh, protection reasons. Um, so uh, I, I won't be there, but uh, it will go ahead. I'm, I've no doubt if, if it's uh, allowed by the state of California. If not, I have a backup plan. Um, yeah, so it's a plan that it's going ahead. I think um, if the if if the vaccine can be rolled out as quickly as the vaccine could be rolled out, then you may find the state of California being able to lift its restrictions. Okay, very good. And then 2022 is in St. Louis for national. I, I uh, yeah, 2022 will be a bit later in the year. It'll be in St. Louis, um, and uh, also. For those that still wanted to come to the UK um, in November 2022, uh, Gordy's organising a convention at um, a place called Crew, um, which is in just just 20 minutes away from Manchester Airport. So it's quite a big international airport. It's uh, two hours away from London by high speed train. Uh, we're organising a convention there at the old railway works. And uh, if you go on YouTube and you look for Railcam UK and you search for Crew, a train passes the building where the convention will be every 30 seconds, um, whether it be a freight train or a passenger train. So, yeah, so we, uh, but 2022 in the US national will be St. Louis in September, not in July. So don't be looking for it in July. <coughs> and then, there may well be, may well be uh, a lot less restrictions then, hopefully. So that's the expectation there is that that will be a much more um, back to normal if there is a normal uh, convention with uh, layout tours and home layout visits and stuff like that. And uh, obviously there's some good models up in St. Louis. And then uh, 23 is our convention here. Uh, it's in August. Um, <clears throat> and then right after that, Mike, you've got your convention in Denver uh, for the uh, narrow gauge, national narrow gauge, correct? That's exactly right. It's like the fifth or eighth or something like that of September, the week right before Labor Day, which is uh, on the 8th. So I guess we're like 4th, 5th, 3rd, 4th, 5th, something like that. So it's literally the next weekend after our convention here. It kind of sounds like it, which is yeah. unfortunate. Yeah, well, that was the only time that the hotel had space available. I understand. It's, it's long enough, isn't it? We can get from one place to the other in a week. Oh, yeah. Anybody coming from, uh, say, Orkney over in the islands there, they could probably hit there and then uh, go past Jama on the way up to Denver. Sure. And, and that's really the, the, the way we need to try to work this together, Mike. Yeah. So it draws more people to both conventions um, and try to figure out how we can tie the two together and, and make it all work for people to go to the NMRA convention here and then trek on up through the panhandle through 
through Chama and into Denver. <coughs> I think that'd be yep. a great, great opportunity. So we'll, we'll be talking. It'd be about interesting. It. Definitely right. interesting. Yeah, it would be. It would be. And, uh, All right, guys. And, uh, and Mike, Mike, uh, I, I, I do know, hopefully it will be announced soon, but there have been um, two bids made for 2024 and 2025. Um, and so they're just going through the process Good. of verifying those bids. So uh, it's looking really positive that we've got conventions going right out uh, for four years. That would be nice to get back in that position. <laughs> so, yes, despite that would... COVID still wanting to, to go, uh, go to the efforts of putting on a national convention. I think by, by 2022, hopefully, definitely by your convention, uh, things will be uh, a little bit less restrictive. Cool. cool. Unless we have COVID-21 hitting us or something. Yeah. Who knows? Let's hope not. Yeah. Well, let's, there's hope, al- let's hope we can there's drop the vocabulary. You know? There's Cordy, always something. Cordy, can you say anything about where those other two conventions are being discussed? Uh, they'll be in the United States. Sure. Okay. I'm waiting for one in Denver again. Uh, that's a possibility. I think they're going to be um, central and western is, I believe, where the bids have come from. That'd be nice. All right, guys. Hey, thanks, everybody, for attending. Uh, all the people who, who joined us from outside of D1, uh, you're welcome anytime. <clears throat> if uh, um, if we can help you guys do anything, we're, we're here to help and, and look forward to... Uh, to having you guys uh, join us here in D1 any and all the time. So have a great afternoon. Have a great week. Have a great month. Stay safe. Stay COVID free. And uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye, everybody.